Oh, it's a Pete Bone Sunday Live. Talking about your whammy bar and your overdrive. Mm -hmm. What's happening, people? Just really sorry I'm late. It became apparent I was going to be late a little while ago. So anyway, hopefully you knew because I said in the chat. But anyways, uh, what's happening? It looks like uh, Gary didn't. Gary didn't know that. He's like, did Pete mean 1945? Uh, no, I meant now. I, I I had to go pick up something on the way here, and then I had to wait, and I it took forever. And uh, so it just uh, was what it was. But anyways, I'm here now, so let's get started. Uh, I put up a little video this week on my Music Man uh, guitar. The Van Halen model from 92 or 93. I think this is a 93. One of... Uh, I think they made around 6,000. So anyway, you might have seen it yesterday. Put it up on the channel. It's, it's all about the guitar. It's all about the history of the guitar, how it came about, how Eddie switched from Kramer to, to Music Man. I, I ended up having a nice chat on the phone last night with Sterling Ball, actually. That was great. Um, and uh, he's he's a great guy. He's a funny guy. And we had a long talk about, <clears throat> you know, just that period and, and stuff. And he sent me some fun photos and things like that of, uh, you know, golf tournaments with Ed and stuff like that. It was cool. Anyway, so it was really nice to chat with him. But um, hopefully you saw the video. If not, please check it out. Tell me what you think. Share it far and wide. I would appreciate it. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see who we got in the uh, in the, uh, the the chat here. We got Surfy. We got Wham E S Y D T. We got Stephen Douglas. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, Pete from Spain, says George. What's up? I miss Spain. I haven't been there for, for so long. Long Starbucks line. No, it wasn't a, it wasn't a Starbucks. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got Ryan here. What's up, Ryan? How you doing? Good to see all you cats. So, um, what else is going on besides that? I'm working on a video right now for a Donner Prince pedal called The Dictator. When you play, there it is. You can see that. Can you see in the corner there? I can't really stretch it because of the power cable. You can see the guy on there. I'm supposed to be. He's supposed to be like a, some sort of Saddam Hussein looking guy, I guess. He's a dictator. <laughs> and uh, his eyes light up when you play. It's pretty cool. Kind of fun. Uh, it's a boost and overdrive. So I've been working on that. I've, I've got um, videos in the works here I'll be doing for... Uh, I wanted to do this one for a long time, but the Bigsby pedal from Game Changer. I mean, getting that done as well as uh, what else? What else? Some new stuff that I can't mention because it's not out yet, but new stuff that's coming pretty soon. Uh, and just, you know, getting back in the swing. But in about eight days, I've actually got to go and start tour with uh, Classic Rock Show on the East Coast. So that'll be a few weeks that I'll be out doing that, playing some U.S. dates with those guys. Maybe I'll see some of you at the shows, I hope. And uh, some fun new songs in the set list for the U.S. and stuff. That's kind of cool. Uh, so that'll probably disrupt my my video thing for a minute again. But but then I'll be back in uh, <clears> the <throat> third week of April or something like that. I'm back and continue on with videos I got to do and stuff for YouTube. Yep. Yep, yep. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see. What else are we talking about in the chat here? Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Just looking through what you got. Oh, here we go. What speakers does Landau use in his Super Reverb? You know, I don't know that. Um, I will say this. I know he's been on a big Marshall kick lately. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure in his Super what he uses. That's a good question. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like Celestian, you know. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, he's kind of a Celestian guy. Uh, can you ask John or Dave to make a smaller super? I'm sick of lugging a 410. I mean, I guess that's a, a Vibrolux, no? Wouldn't a Vibrolux be similar? Or is it? 210 you know with a with a half power kind of situation i would probably look at that and see if that gets you in the zone do they even make like a uh 
a Vibrolux reverb that's uh, uh, any more that's like a, let's see, Fender Lux. Uh, you can get a 68 custom Vibro. That's interesting. It's like a one channel. Oh, that's a 110. Oh, that's no, Vibro Champ. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. Fender custom Vibrolux reverb, 40 watt, 210 combo. $800 on reverb right now. I'm just looking to see. Uh, here's a 72 Vibrolux reverb, 40 watt. Oh, they're 40. It is 40 watts. That's interesting. I always thought it was like a... I, I don't know Fender, I'll just say, as well as I probably should. Um, but I, I was always under the assumption that a Vibrolux was like a uh, 210 deluxe reverb basically but maybe i'm wrong i'm seeing plenty here yeah i guess they were 35 watts back in the day uh interesting i'll have to do a little more research yeah they were f interesting 40 watts out of i, I had no idea that's a, that's kind of a unique amp then 40 watts but 210 there's some vintage ones on here for like four grand at guitar center uh 68 custom vibrolux reverb well that's the way i would go probably one of those um 68 custom vibrolux reverb you know those are the silver face ones they make now two channel 35 watt 210 guitar combo why don't you just go go that way i've got one of the vibrolux uh or sorry, I've got one of the Princeton 68 Customs, and it's a really nice sounding little amp. You can do upgrades of speakers or tubes or whatever, play around with, uh, you know, they don't come with a bright cap, I don't think, um, which they probably did originally. Uh, but you could always put one on it. It doesn't have a switch, does it? Oh, yeah, they do. They have a switch, the Vibrolux. The Princeton doesn't. But the Vibrolux has a, a bright switch, so you can, yeah. That's, a, that's your amp, man. Just go Vibrolux. Probably sound great. Close enough, you know. I mean, it's never gonna, you know. There's no substitute for <clears throat> speakers and moving air and stuff like that, so it's gonna sound smaller. But it's probably gonna sound just fine, and and probably in some ways even more gigable and stuff because of the, the 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 volume. It just won't be so, you know, so quite so loud when you're cranking it into the zone because you're just not moving as much air with with two fewer speakers. Really enjoyed the EVH video, says Fareed. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I know I'm way late, says JR, but thank you for the awesome chat with Kim Thill. I've been thinking about sending him a message and just saying hi. I really enjoyed it as well. I really enjoyed speaking with him. It was so cool. Uh, for those that haven't seen it, it was a uh, Sunday Live I did maybe, uh, I don't know, a month and a half ago with Kim maybe more I guess it was before I went away wasn't it it was in December so it was more than that yeah oh yeah oh sure super what Dave what changes did you and Dave make to the tone of your Jamino I think you said it was a little stiff well it had high filtering I can't remember I don't think we actually changed the filtering I think it's still got that Jamino filtering in it which is fairly you know it's definitely like 70s filtering or maybe even a little stiffer um but uh other than that it's a you know now like a jose mod you know plexi situation so um the filtering you could definitely you know dial back to kind of 68 spec or, or 69 or 70 you know it just depends dave can do all that stuff if you if, if you're interested filtering for those that don't know it's this fine line um amps that do kind of unstable things and ghost notes and stuff like that um you know the filtering if you put them stiffer filtering throughout the amp it kind of filters out all that stuff but it also makes the amp feel the more filtering you go it can make it feel a little stiffer a little less responsive or a little less gooey under the fingers you know so sometimes that stuff is good. Like I actually like ghost notes. Um, not all the time. My top hat that's up there, it ghost notes like like it ghosts like crazy. Like like the ghost notes are almost as loud as the the fundamental. <laughs> but it sure sounds cool, you know. And AC thirties and old Marshalls did that, you know. And, they, and if you look at them on a scope, I guess I don't know how to do that. But when I see amp techs do that, you can see all this junk in the 
bottom, you know, foots and around, and that's the all the stuff. And then if you filter it, more stiffer filtering, all that stuff goes away. You know, that's a fine line between uh, brilliant and stupid. Uh, running says, what amp did you use on the latest Van Halen video? Uh, so it's the Soldano, because um, I assume that's what he probably would have used. A lot of people in the comments said, hey, that was actually a telly on that song. And I, I can totally believe that. I wasn't I'm not able to find a lot of like track by track rundown on what Eddie used on those tunes back then. It gets a little fuzzy after 1984, you know, but uh, as far as online information goes, I find. But uh, some people who sounded like they knew said that's definitely a custom shop telly that Fender had sent him. And I believe it because when I was listening to it, I go, this is kind of clean and single coily. And so I was like, I wonder if it's almost like 57 Strat because he played a Strat sometimes on like run around and stuff or not run around on the. Was the song I did on uh, "Finish What You Started"? You know, that's like a DI Strat and stuff. So, but I definitely thought you know that intro sounds like single coil. But then, of course, he played the Music Man live always. You know, so it's on right here, right now, and stuff. So I thought still legit, and it's on the solo with the neck pickup and all that. Vibrolux has a different output transformer. Doesn't quite sound the same. Well, it would have to be different, I would think, for. Well, no, it's about the same power. Interesting. Well, I don't know. Maybe you could get a super reverb transformer and put it in uh, a different output transformer and put it in a Vibrolux. That might be an interesting amp or mod to do. You could probably do that, right? I don't know. Maybe. What do I think of the new Bogner JB45? I haven't checked it out. So I shouldn't comment because I don't know yet. Um. Anyways, just to finish my thought here, uh, yeah, so it's Soldano in my video into the Sur Reactive Load, which works great for doing stuff like this. Uh, I just use preset 1-1, one, one, which is a greenback and a 412 with a 57 and a, and a Royer, uh, an IR of that. <clears throat> and I send that out into my interface, and then I add the H3000 plug in and a little stereo delay, and it pretty much sounds like that tone, Just and it's very easy to actually get there. <laughs> It's not not a difficult uh, uh, formula at all to kind of put into practice. And, you know, I could, I could dial that sound up right now in about 10 minutes or less. So uh, it's pretty cool. Modern tech, isn't it amazing? Isn't it just amazing? Uh, how about a Kemper profile of your rig? Well, one of these days, I guess. I mean, which rig? <laughs> it's like... It always changes. Uh, I, I should probably be getting into doing at this point Kemper packs and stuff, you know, doing a little a little thing with all of that. Kemper and Helix presets and Quad Cortex and all that good stuff. It just requires a little bit of time. I do plan on putting some time in getting towards the summer into some fun projects like that to kind of, you know, expand. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Area... 859 says that was a great video on Van Halen guitars, Kramer to Music Man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, there's a super chat I got to grab there. Uh, but first, uh, just got a 94 Evil Twin amp that is killer. Way too heavy, but sounds incredible. It's an amazing tube amp. Who did the Evil Twin? Didn't, didn't Phil X have an amp called the Evil something or other? Uh I'm on, I'm on uh, reverb right now. I have a thing open, so maybe I can take a look. What a, Evil Twin, Fender Twin amp, Evil Twin. What, a, what the heck was that? Fender Twin, 94 Evil Twin. What were these? Were these like a, like a gain amp? It says... Uh, it just doesn't doesn't have a lot of inf information about it here. They're, they're, they're pretty cheap. Uh, some people say they're loud as, you know what, a true sleeper. I uh, never heard of this twin variant until a few months ago, this guy says on Reverb. Was hesitant, but it's not the Red Knob twin. Uh, well, people seem to like it. Um, it's interesting. 
I don't know anything about this amp, to be honest. I know the red. I, I used to play a little bit a Shulman, which was just a head version of the Twin with the red knobs in the '80s. I had access to one of those for a little while in a band I was in. This would be around '87 or '88, and it sounded pretty cool. I thought, but now I'd probably hear it and go, I don't know, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it'd be great. Uh, let's see here. Saw the CRS, uh, in Glasgow, Scotland. Great gig and sound. Thanks. Do you and James EQ differently to stand out? Uh, you know, just the nature of the amps, they were pretty different. So James used, a, uh, on tour, he has a Plexi, like it's a legit 68 super bass, 50 watt. Oh, sorry. It's a 72 or 71, 71 or 72. It's a metal panel, but it's a 50 watt, 1986 spec. So it's a super bass spec. A little lower gain, a little less mid-range. Sounds great, though. Rhythm tone is killer with that thing. And then when you hit it with a pedal, it's just awesome. Actually gave me a new appreciation for those amps. I was kind of like, kind of want one of these, like a bass spec 50 now. Um, it it just, it's kind of just more Malcolm Young, which, you know, is what he used, I think, super bass hundreds. But it has a like a, a really great rock rhythm guitar sound you can turn it up to like seven or eight and it doesn't it's not as distorted as a uh you know a lead spec it's a little more just less less mids and less compression and stuff like that and a little more punchy um and then of course you can just hit it with a pedal for more so that's kind of he uses the axe effects with it in four cable but the, he also had a beautiful 68 cab out there that sounded really good. It was his fav, my favorite guitar sound that he's had on tour, for sure, out of all the... Because he was using these um, good-sounding amps, these 633 amps, I think. They're a boutique from England. Uh, always sounded good. First year, I thought when I was playing with him that his sound was kind of bright. The second year, he, or maybe the third year, that he brought this 212 cabinet that had big Alnico... Uh, speakers in it that, that were like an Alnico that was much warmer sounding 12 inch speakers. He used a 410 cab for a while and that always sounded bright and a little edgy to me. And then he gets this 212 Alnico cab that he ran with the 633. That thinks then I was like significantly, I think, better tone this year. It sounds really good. Uh, and then with the Marshall and the old 68 greenback loaded cab, it sounds really, really good. <clears throat> he does the song in uh, Brothers in Arms by, you know, Mark Offer Dive Straits in the set. And he, the neck pickup on the Les Paul, he has a really, really nice tone. Just really, it's very rich and and full sounding and it sounds great in the PA. So, and my tone by contrast is much more just because of the nature of the PT-100 and stuff. Um, I've got a more, I mean, it, it, I, like... It's not as low gain. It's tighter, a little leaner and gainier, of course, as you would expect, maybe from that amp from me, you know. And it sounds really good, the contrast, I think, because I've got the, you know, the, the gainier sort of more aggressive thing. And then he's got this rich lower gain thing. So, and it wasn't, that's not something that's really a, we discussed with front of house or anything like that it, it's just kind of the way that it is uh but that's the way the amps sound i guess and it just sort of ended up working well together it makes sense when you think about it uh yeah um awesome new evh video did you buy that guitar um well it's like i said in the video so i i consider it on uh i consider it on extended loan that's how i consider it simon uh Simon's a great guy. He, he's a guitar player and stuff as well. But I think he wanted to, I think he liked seeing videos like that and stuff and the, the stuff that I've done in the EVH vein before. And I think he wanted to see that guitar that he's had for so long used in things, you know, maybe, you know, I'm just hypothesizing. But he, uh, so he put the guitar in my hands and said sort of, got to be, do things with it, I think, you know, was the vibe, so. Anyways, yes, sir, says, looking for a reasonably priced rotary pedal. Uh, how about the um, new Strymon Vibe one? Uh, that Maybe that's not exactly what you want because you want a rotary. So the ventilator is the best one I've tried. Um, 
you know, line six, man, not bad uh, at all. I used to use the Roto Machine. Is that what it was called? Let me see if there's one on Reverb right now. Uh, they might even still make it. I don't think so. It, I used that for used for a hundred bucks. The Line Six Roto Machine. There's some online. I used that with Chris Cornell uh, for Black Hole Sun, and it sounded great. I thought so. Yep, I can. You can see them for a hundred bucks on Reverb right now. Go get one. That's my recommendation. Tone Core Roto Machine. Uh, there's one in Concord, New Hampshire for sale right now. Run and get it. Tell me it's not good. I don't know if it's ventilator quite, you know, but it's a small pedal and, you know, it's about the size of a boss pedal or a little bigger. And, um, and it's a hundred bucks as opposed to, you know, that bigger thing. And if you just need a good, you know, solid Leslie sound, I'm sure it'll do the trick for you. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting. Steven says, I've always wanted a vibrator ever since Nuno used one on waiting for the punchline. That was very, I remember that when he, um, he used a, a cranked up or a vibro lux, or was it a vibro? It was a brown one, right? Like, so very kind of, I guess, long tail phase inverter, I think, that kind of brown, uh, you know, sort of proto Marshall sort of thing. And Nuno said that he used it on that record. I was always very surprised by that. But, anyways. Nuno doesn't really strike me as an amp guy. He just seems to use kind of what's, you know, he kind of seems to use Marshall or whatever he uses now. He had his own signature amp that Randall for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, your Van Halen cover was amazing. Thanks. Dead on. Eddie would approve. Thanks. Um, yeah. I, I tried to, you know, I had fun learning the riff and trying to you know do it justice and play it right it's a really fun riff to play actually It'd be a fun song to play live in a band um yeah enjoyable looking for an amp sim and a pedal like a uad effects that does a mesa boogie mark one hmm. <clears throat> i don't know too many mark one mesa's got a lot of pedals but i'm not sure you know that they've made over the years there might be something there that they do that's similar uh let's see uh what else we got here mark says bradshaw line out box i have one do you want it i think you're saying it's for you cheers from sunland what's up man um i think they're similar to the the sir right i've got uh uh some nice like sir ones that are basically sort of like a they take a tap off the signal and then the pot sends out the line out and then you get a ground lift and a, and a phase switch and stuff like that. But thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I don't think I need one in particular. I, I would say, you know, probably just somebody would probably buy that from you. Cause I have a, the, uh, I usually keep it in here. Mm. Oh, it's probably over here. I'm surprised there's not more companies that actually make them because they're kind of useful. Here's my Sir one. Is it similar to this? You know, so the, the concept with these is you plug the your amp in, speaker goes in, and then it plug it in there, and the speaker passes so it passes the, through to the cabinet. But then it's taking a tap off the signal, and out of this jack, you've got a line out then. And you can drive effects or, you know, into a power amp or whatever you want. you got a ground lift and a face. Just a very simple line out that's clean and allows you to take a tap and... You know, Scott Henderson uses one similar to that. That's, I think, this the Sir that, you know, to drive his, he always has a, you know, kind of simple wet dry setup where he runs that boss effect of his. And uh, they're, they're cool. Um, might you consider a taller and wider 212 for the PT50? Uh, I don't really want to do a taller one. I, <clears throat> I I just angle the cabinet back really if I want to do something like that. But um, we've already got the 212 that I really like for the PT100. I th I think probably we would just use that, you know, um, the 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 because I've already got a kind of a full range of cabinets. There's a 412. There's a 212 that's horizontal. There's a 212 that is kind of like this. 
you know, the staggered little guy for the PT-15, and then we got a 112. So I feel like I've got a full range of cabinets there. Um, the vertical cabs, I've never really, I used to have Mesa ones, you know, I've never really been a, a big fan of those. And then you can't really put a head on them easily if it's bigger. Not that mine will be, it'll be the size of a small box or something. It'll probably be too wide for, a, for a, you know, a vertical 212. So anyways, uh, uh do I have any ETA for a full length video? Well, I, I haven't been making one or anything, but UA affects lion. I, I guess I could. I, um, I did, you know, a video with blue Saraceno. Maybe have you seen that the, uh, blues and, uh, James Santiago, we all sat around at, you know, James's studio and, um, kind of played through it and talked about it and stuff. So there's that video. If you haven't caught that one, it's quite long and we're, we're waxing on about marshals and bright caps and all kinds of things in that video. Uh, and then I've got my other little clip that I put out, but, uh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Evil robot. That was the, the Phil X amp. Yeah. Uh, here's a super chat, a couple super chats. I got to get to your firewolf thoughts on what boost pedal in front of a blues junior. I mean, it really depends what you want. You know, you put a range master in there and it'll get aggressive and sing like a bird. Uh, you could do a, Something like a, a Sir Coco is always one of my favorites with the mid boost and the clean boost. And then you can pick, you, know, you get just a little lift with the clean boost or you can hit the mid boost for more like, sounds like adding a gain stage, you know, almost in front uh, that's tight. That's kind of one of my favorites, you know. I love the unit 67.2 or whatever it's called from Dry Bell that I have on my board. Uh, it'll do treble boost as well as clean boost. So it'll simply cue and you can even add compression. It's really cool. Uh, great Van Halen video on the Kramer Music Man transition, though. I read Van Halen using an American telly on the run around rhythm track. I heard it was a custom shop telly um, on the rhythm track. I, I thought when I was doing it, I just like that song. So I thought, well, I'm going to play this song. And you know what? He played live on tours, you know, for all the tours using that guitar. So screw it. I wasn't necessarily trying to nail the the record sound because, believe me, when I did it, I was, I was going, this sounds like a single coil to me. Um, I was aware. It's a little cleaner, but when you see him play it live, he's playing it on the Music Man. He played it on right here, right now, and everything with the Music Man. So I thought, oh, screw it. I'll just, I like the song. I want to play this riff. So, and then I can use the neck pickup on the solo and the wall. Here it is. I pulled it out for the, the, uh, the solo. Ed gave me this wall. I've got two of these, and this is the one that he, he gifted me one day. I brought him a, a phaser pedal once and i had the bottom engraved it was a really cool custom phaser from a canadian company um and uh it was an, a nice phase 90 style pedal you know so i brought it to him and he's so sweet he was like i brought it up to him and gave it to him he was like oh no oh, i don't even you know he was all like taken aback and then he like ran in the other room and he came back with this and uh and a pair of the striped um Van Halen Converse <laughs> and he gave me goes, what size shoes are you <laughs> and he gave me a pair of shoes it was so sweet you know it was like I was like you don't have to you know it's like I was just bringing you this for you know I wanted to have this you know made for you or whatever because I like them it's, it, they were cool it was retrosonic a Canadian company they made a nice analog uh phase 90 sort of style and a uh, with it was a phase 90 style with a depth control too so it had an extra you know control on it, it was really nice but anyway um that's my my Van Halen wah there. I, I really like his wah, too. It's a terrific sounding. You know, it's got a nice kind of notchy thing to it that's just kind of unique. It's really cool. Uh, there's Steve Roy there with uh, uh, Super Chat. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thanks very much. Um, let's see. I have a question on the Digitech drop pedal. Okay. I've used it a little bit. Saw our argument on that pedal placement. Some were saying start of the chain. Others saying after the distortion. Uh, we talked about this last week, didn't we? I think I thought we kind of covered my thinking on on these. I I think probably the best place to put it is uh, because what think about it. You're trying to you know it's analyzing your entire guitar signal, right? You're not playing single notes, so it's looking at all the harmonics and the different stuff and however it works, and it's shifting everything. You don't want to pollute 
that with distortion, I don't think. Um, and then try and pitch shift everything because it's just full, loaded with harmonics and stuff, right? So the best thing to do would be cleanest guitar signal possible so that it can see your you know exactly what your guitar sounds like and you know analyze that and then shift it now an interesting thing happens though i find this, this kind of contradictory but when you're um shifting single notes i find it can sound really good to actually do it post distortion i don't know why i guess because you're not sending it sounds cleaner that kind of makes sense to me because you're not if you do it post distortion and then you add a harmony so say i'm talking about diatonic harmony i'm not talking about pitch shifting the entire thing down with no dry signal i'm talking about adding a diatonic harmony like i do live with classic rock show i play the solo and crazy on you with a diatonic harmony added right and it sounds more like two guitars and cleaner if you if you do the pitch shift than post distortion if you're only playing one note at a time it 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 has more of a diet like a harmonized two guitar sound which is cool but if i'm playing full chords and stuff i can only hypothesize that there's no way the drop pedal would sound better post distortion because it needs to analyze your guitar signal and everything you're trying to simulate you know the whole thing the whole shebang with all these like you know intervals ringing together and stuff um you're going to want to have a real you know a clean sound not something that's polluted with a bunch of i'm not you know I say polluted because it's like a distorted guitar signal is messed up. It's distorted. It's, it's you know, um, full of all these harmonics and overtones and stuff that that come out when you distort it, and that's going to be more garbled and messed up to to do. I think uh, po you know post distortion. So I hope that makes sense. We'll CRS do a meet and greet on upcoming shows. Generally, we do. We go, um, as long as the show's not too late and the venue has to close or whatever, we do, um, like if it's an earlier show, 7.30 show or whatever. Like in England, we if we do 7.30 show, we'll do a meet and greet. If we do an 8 o'clock show, usually don't because it's like pushing closer to venue curfew and stuff and the venues want to everybody leave and they don't want a bunch of people hanging out in the lobby afterwards. So, uh, But I assume we're going to do the same thing where there's probably... Uh, you know, meet and greets for most of the shows, I think, after the show. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you need a JTM 45. You know, I would love a JTM 45. Um, I think a JTM 45 is a different thing, though, than a base spec um, Marshall, like a 50 watt. It's a different power section. You know, a, a JTM 40, yeah, it's probably similarities, but a base spec Marshall still has the EL 34s and you know, like a 68 or 69, 70, 71, 72, 1986 is a different circuit than a JTM 45. Probably some, yeah, sure, similarities, but um, a JTM 45 can sound a little uh, like I like it, but it's good up to a point, and then it can sound a little bloated and a little like not tight or something to me. And you know, whereas the base spec Marshall that james has has a little bit more of a punchy sound to it like it holds together really nicely and it's not loose uh, like a jtm 45 can be um that's at least the way I, that i hearing it i'm not back to, you know side to side comparing but my experience with jtm 45s is i like them up to a point but not beyond that and then i feel like they're a little you know like it's not exactly my thing i prefer lead spec uh 68 you know lead that's my favorite but there was something special about the 1986, the super bass kind of, you know, 50 watt that James had where I'm like, I think I could use one of these. Like, this is cool, you know, and you can turn it up to like eight and it doesn't get flubby, actually. You know, it's it's just cleaner than a than a uh, than a lead spec. It's just a, a little bit of a different sound. So, yeah. Could the, the SL68 Mark II do the super bass? Well, it's more than just the bright cap. It's a different EQ thing i think and i'm not sure i think it's mainly in the eq and there's just some changes in the preamp i would have to ask sir let me just send sir a text and uh see if he can articulate can you tell me kind of in layman's terms the difference between base spec and lead spec 
Oh, of course, it spells base with an E. Just one sec here. I'm going to... Blank. Yeah. See if he hits me back. He may. He may not, but he may. I, d I know basically it's like, um, it's just preamp stuff, but the, it's not just a bright cap thing. It's EQ too. Um, how do you manage signal de 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 degradation going inboard to outboard and back? Um, so, uh, buffers. <clears throat> I, I use wireless live, so I'm buffered right out of the guitar. So that is just kind of the way that is. But um, basically, you're, uh, you know, if, if you've got a buffer on your pedal board that's close to the front of the chain, you're probably good. Like if you're running, you know, 15 or 20 feet of cable into the board and then you hit um, a buffer relatively soon, say you've got maybe a fuzz or a wah or something, you don't want to have a buffer, you want a couple true bypass pedals up front. Okay, cool. Now hit a buffer. And, uh, and at that point, um, your signal gets, you know, turned to low impedance and then it, it essentially, you know, layman's terms gets pushed through the rest of your pedals and stuff like that. And shouldn't degrade. Um, you may need another buffer down the chain, you know, depending on kind of what you're doing. But uh, another thing is the effect loop on an amplifier. If you're running long cable lengths or, or even if you're running shorter cable lengths, you want to have a properly buffered effect loop so that it, it drives your effects and comes back in clean and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. But yeah, it's all about buffers essentially and, uh, having them strategically placed, uh, Mike McCready was using the Fender modeling thing at the show we played with him last weekend. Not terrible, not great either. That's interesting. Only that? He would be the last guy I would think that would go modeling. Those guys are kind of known for amps and stuff, but maybe he's just having fun with it. I don't know. What what kind of show was it, Chris? Was it a uh, was he doing his own thing and maybe he was just flying in and needed something small or something, you know? Interesting. Uh Okay, what else we got here? I know I got a suit, another super chat I got to hit there. Um, OLP, that's what I was trying to think of during EV, EVH vid. Isn't that a picture of a maple top laminated to the guitar top? Not on my guitar. Uh, I think they used to do that sometimes, but no, these are, these are, this is a flame top. I actually spoke with Sterling about that. Um, Sterling claimed that Eddie's thing with Basswood started with Alan Holdsworth because Alan was doing was doing Basswood and he he uh, kind of inspired Ed to to go Basswood because Ed was always with the harder woods and stuff and then Alan was doing these different you know remember when he had Charvel build them guitars and they had kind of different bodies I I remember he had three of them made a white one a red one something else and experimenting with different body woods maybe one was mahogany can't remember but i remember one being basswood for sure and then the other one being like pine or something odd i think i'm such a nerd i remember this but yeah when alan had these guitars built so I, anyways ed was big alan fan and uh and but you know to get a little more brightness they did the the maple top so and there's a great combo maple top on basswood you know there's a whole bunch of comments that that well, maybe not a whole bunch, but quite a few where people were like, Tone Woods, a bunch of garbage, you know, and all that in the in the comments for the video. But that's that's poop. That's just people that don't have ears. <laughs> the wood totally makes a difference, you know. So that's not just about electronics, you know. I mean, if you send enough, you know, guitar into enough gain and <clears throat> you know distortion and crap you know then you're not gonna yeah maybe then you won't like oh i can't really hear a difference or whatever you know but you know i did a video years ago anybody wants to check it out for um vintage king where i compared a couple different sirs two t's and two s's and uh they're alder and ash and 
rosewood and maple fingerboards, like a couple different. But otherwise, these guitars were the same spec. So it's four guitars, two T's, two S's. And uh, I believe the Tellys had, I can't remember exactly, but you can go watch the video if you just look for Pete Thorne, Sir, Classic T, Classic S, Vintage King. Search that and the video will pop up. You tell me if you can't hear the difference between the guitars. I mean, it's pretty, it's exactly what you would think too. The Swamp Ash body sounds more airy, less mids, a little more top in the whole nine yards. And then the alder is just a little more like alder. I find to be a very balanced wood generally, a little more full through the mids and stuff like that. And it's very, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a simple YouTube video, but I did it with the intention of showing the difference between the, the guitars and the woods. And I didn't change a damn thing. And you can hear it in the video. I swear it's like, there it is. It's like, I can hear the difference between these, the two different S's and the two different T's. And it's exactly what you would expect it would be. So it's not like night and day, but you know, everything matters. So, you know, I'm one to believe that everything matters. You change the bridge, it changes the tone. You change a pickup, it changes the tone. You know, pot value changes the tone. And certainly woods, you know, body woods changes the tone. Black Mountain Volume Pedals. Never tried that. Have not. Have not. Uh, there's Peter from Belgium. What's up? Oh, you sent me an Einoven. Uh, that was a really fun gig. Classic show. Great show. Thank you. You played Dave's 50 Watt. Oh, you played Dave's 50 Watt Plexi. Oh, you're just asking, like, not there at the show, but I've have I played a 50 Watt Plexi and your Sir 68 different sound wise between the amps? Well, um, you know, Dave works on all my stuff and he's a good friend of mine. So I'm around a lot <clears throat> at his place and I hear um, when he's working on things. So I did hear the amp the, the, and he did a really, really good job matching his, uh, I guess you're asking about, I don't know if you're asking about his original Plexi versus my SL68 or if you're asking about his new amp that he's got, the new 50 watt vintage line called the Plex, I think. That he's offering but it's a terrific amp and he, he you know dave's got really good ears and he works really hard to match things um and sometimes i'll come in and we'll sit there and listen and go back and forth and he'll be like what do you think you know and i, I it's a it's a terrific sounding amp that new one i mean dave's kind of cracked the code with marshall's as has you know john sir and th these guys they know how to make um new amps sound like old amps you know they know what the you know, it's not like I would say the 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 only thing about the old amps is those old transformers. Maybe there's something going on there where it's just like a little bit of magic, you know, in the heart of the amplifier and stuff. But other than that, I mean, there's great sounding, you know, good, you know, Haber and the, the new transformers just sound really good. And the differences are pretty minor, man, between like when you hear, you know, a great old one and then um you know, a new amp that's designed to sound like that. And they, these guys, between Sir and Friedman, I mean, there's, there's other people in the world too, but they're two, certainly two of the pre premium pro, uh, premium dudes. No, I don't know. What do you call it? They're prominent, you know, uh, that, that really know how to to dial it in. And they, they've got that code cracked. So, you know, and with modern kind of amp switchers and stuff, and also, you know, like using uh, load and reamp, like the, the power station, you can you can now sit there and, not burn your ears out of it. You can listen to the two amps and switch between them on a switcher into something like a, a power station and do it at a reasonable volume and really hear, you know, at volume, it's like, geez, it's loud, you know, but, and, and it's cool to listen like that too, but you'll burn out pretty quick, you know, with, with it at a reduced, you know, attenuated or, you know, uh, loaded down and then reamped kind of situation in an amp switcher, you can go back and forth and really dial things in. So, um, differences between them i mean on his new amp he's got he did an interesting thing where on the normal channel or channel you know channel one and two on a four hole marshall um channel one obviously is the one that's usually got a bright cap and it's a little more you know it's the more aggressive of the two and then the other one's just kind of the the neutral sounding channel he added a bright that's switchable on either one so you can now you know do things that you can't do on an original four hole marshall by switching in that that bright on the other channel and then varying them and and i believe they're internally jumpered and stuff so it makes it really easy to get some sounds that you can't even get out of an old one an sl68 has uh, especially the mark ii version you know is you got a switchable bright cap now so you can do no cap or two different values of cap and um and then you've also got a switch for the fat cap which is the 
you know, no secret now, the Van Halen thing that just added a little more fatness in the, in the preamp, a little more, it's not really gain, but it's just, you know, a little more, it sounds thicker. And then the uh, switch to go between a couple different mid pot values, um, which is quite subtle. And it's great. And, it, you know, both those amps, I mean, they're terrific. You know, there's a modern, I, I have no reservations about gigging a, an SL68 over, say, my old Marshall 50 there or something. I mean, I don't think there's, there's, there's absolutely nothing that I'd be missing, you know, gigging the SL68, which is you can't see it, but it's sitting right there. That's it. Uh, and I did use it on Classic Rock Show last year. I really enjoyed using it. Actually, it was terrific. So, uh, so uh, raw and punch, thick, authentic sound between the two. I mean, yeah, I think that an SL68 sounds every bit as juicy. And I've done a plenty of video videos where, you know, those Van Halen tone kind of videos, one that I did with, you know, Dave and everything. And I'm using the SL68 and part of it, and I'm using a 69 Marshall and the rest. Uh, and you can listen to that and kind of, you know, see what you think. But I think they're pretty darn close, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, moving down here. Let's see. Well, lots of people sent, came to the shows in Europe and stuff. It's awesome. I saw you in Finland. Amazing show. Absolutely superb playing. Thank you. I think that when playing skills, feel, and tone are at your level, it almost sounds unreal when you hear it live. Wow, that's too kind. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I had a great time in Finland. Uh, it's a terrific place. Love that part of the world. Hope next year we can also do Norway and Sweden and Denmark as well. I'd love to get all those places uh, and certainly go back to Netherlands. But Finland was just terrific. Um, really had a great time. Had the best meal that I that I had all tour there. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the restaurant. It was eh, I'm not going to remember, but it was a place downtown that wasn't too far from. Uh, well, it was just kind of centrally downtown, and it was in in Helsinki, and they they had a set menu that was like you know a three course or a five course, and then with wine pairing. I did the three course and did the wine pairing, <laughs> and it was outstanding. I felt elated after that meal. So a nice part of the world you live in there. It's cold, but it's lovely. Kind of reminds me of where I grew up, Edmonton, Canada. Um, at least, you know, the climate and the way things look. Uh, what do you guys think about the new Line 6 Pod Express? Looks cool. Uh, I It doesn't have an editor. I didn't know that. Maybe they just made it to be as simple as possible. I mean, there's still the little HX Stomp or whatever, right? It's it's probably just similar, but even a simpler, cheaper version of that, right? With a lot of the same kind of sounds. I mean, you know, it's it's amazing what they're making these days for... For low dough, that'll do a million things. And fit on your pedal board. Kings X touring right now. If you wanted to catch them, I would love to. I know they just played at Nam, and I wasn't there because I was in England, and I would have loved to have seen them. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the best bits of advice I ever heard was Nuno saying that it doesn't matter if you play a song like the original artist; just get to the notes. It'll be okay. I don't know. Sounds to me like he's saying, "Do it like the original artist." Though, <laughs> I guess I got to hear the context of the quote that he that he said. Um, you know, Nuno is a uh, stylist, so he's a um, known for you know his thing, and and so he can play. You know, you wouldn't expect Nuno to play anything exactly like Van Halen or whatever, or or Ingve to play anything exactly like Van Halen if he was playing, you know, you're, you're expecting their sort of sound and style and interpretation because um, they're such a unique stylist. I was talking about this a little bit this week, like with Friedman, and we were talking about John Sykes um, and what a stylist he is and how it's very, very difficult to play like him, but he's so good and and like got his, his own... You don't want them to play anything like anybody else, you know. And that's the thing. You wouldn't want Nuno to sound exactly like Van Halen, I guess, you know, because he's got his own thing. Or, and and John's another guy that you know. Some of these players are just so unique and with um, their own kind of intent. Like you know, it's them, you know, that thing where you hear them play and you're like, ah, you know. So, anyway, and and John is definitely he's he's one of those guys that. You know, it doesn't get enough credit. Actually, it's just underrated. It's so good. 
uh, the Lex Surst, Lex Lexerst. I never know how to say. I, I, I've I've known, and then I always forget. And that's the the Alex Lifeson, his nickname, right? With the Vegatram is sweet. Yeah, I love that he's doing those guitars, and especially with Godan. Godan's a really neat guitar company. I mean, they're like you know, they did it different. They're kind of like I don't know, maybe they're like the Music Man of Canada or something. Like smaller. They always they made their guitars like really reasonably priced, and yet they're still made in North America. You know, made in Quebec and uh and um really quality guitars i think uh like i've got a lot of respect for that company actually so it's cool that he did it with them i think and you know kept it canadian and stuff i think it's really neat but they are look really cool looking how much are they i wonder i'm still on reverb here let's take a look and see i kind of want one <laughs> even though it's basically like my signature guitar uh oh i spelled it wrong Lurkst. Maybe that's it. Lurkst. Lurkst. And he's also got a signature overdrive pedal. Um, maybe the guitars aren't available yet, so I'm not seeing them. Uh, uh, I'm going to take a quick look here because I'm so... Ooh, they ain't cheap, are they? Yeah, they're 4K. So it's okay. Never mind what I said. It's about the same price as uh, as my signature guitar. Mine's even a little less. I think mine's thirty eight. But if you look, they've got some other ones here that are uh, like the Godan Session T Pro Electric, like really nice looking guitars for thirteen ninety nine. Or here's another one nine ninety nine, a fixed bridge one at Sweetwater, and they're made in, in the states. Like these guitars go under the radar. I should, you know, when people are like, "Hey, how do I get a good guitar for under?" You know, I should mention these more. Um, to be honest, you know, uh, because they're, they're, I think they make a really quality guitar for the money. It is a really nice looking guitar, the Lifeson one. I'm just looking at the, the Vega Trim one. Looks like it's got a nice neck heel. Kind of a, you know, it's very, very, very similar to my signature guitar and about the same money. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. It's got the switch that he had, which is a three way switch, right? I think. So what's the deal with that? Let's see what it says. It's like a little three-way toggle. For those that want to follow along, I'm looking at Chuck Levin's Washington Music Center right now, and I'm looking at a, a picture of this guitar on their, their website. So it's got the Vega Tram. Uh, it's got his signature pickups. It, it doesn't say anything about the switch, actually, but I do find it interesting. Oh, three-way toggle switch. So I guess you can't get the in-between positions on the pickups. Is that right? That would be odd to me. I would I would probably want to wire it so that... You know what I would do if I got one of those guitars? Because it's a volume and a tone. So it's a Strat, HSS, for those that can't see. Um, a three-way toggle switch that looks like a Les Paul to style toggle down on the lower bout. I would wire it so that the three-way was bridge, bridge and neck, and neck. Uh, in the three positions, and then the tone control controlled the middle pickup, and you can blend it in at any, at any, uh, anything. I got, oh man, the, 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 uh, the list on the guitar is five grand, and they're offering it for four. So $39.99, list is $49.60. Cool though. And then there's a Floyd version as well. Version with the Floyd, same price, I think. Does it have a lock nut? does appear to have a Floyd with a lock nut. Yeah. So you can get it with either the Vega or the Floyd. And it looks like it's an ebony board as well. It's very, 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 very similar. It's swamp ash body, so that's different. But very, very similar to my guitar, really, in many ways. Uh, all right. We got 434 people online, so nice to have you all here. Uh, let's see. Love the video with Blues and Santiago. That's the 68 Lion video for UA. Could have listened for two more hours of that. It was a nice chat. We just, you know, they just rolled the cameras and we just hung out. So, um, am I this far back in the chat? I might be, uh, cause I was talking about that a long time ago. I better move down. Uh, Jason, just wondering about your thoughts on the new bad cat lineup and which the amps you bonded with. You know, I, I, I liked, uh, I did videos for two of them now, and I'm going to screw up the names. I'm not going to remember, but um, they both sound really good, man. I mean, they um, they uh, are doing neat things, you know. 
the first one I remember really digging that was a hot cat or something. Um, you know, I'm going to screw up the names, but it was, uh, you know, 40 watt or whatever, two EL 34 kind of affair, I think. And it had really nice, rich mid range. And I was comparing it to my Marshall 50 up there and it kind of made the Marshall sound even a little ratty, I think. So it did sound really good. Uh, did you like the jazz three pick? Kinda. Uh, I can play with those. I find they're maybe not the best for me for rhythm guitar. You know, it's nice for precision kind of lead playing. Um, for rhythm, I, I kind of like a bigger pick. I mean, this is a hacked up one, but I just use an Altex. Uh, you know, there's a Altex 73 from Dunlop. And I find they work well on acoustic, electric. I can play lead with them. I can play rhythm and I can almost play a whole show with one and they don't, you know, I like that about them, like the material. So I just use those. The 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 jazz three is a little small for me, maybe. So, uh, for for you know playing aggressive rhythm guitar, that kind of thing. I like the pick to have a little give too. A little bit of a give. Um. Yeah. Uh, let's see. For the coffee fund, have been rocking honeymoon suite this week. Thank you, Dave, for the super chat. Appreciate that. Canada rocks. Canada does rock, and Honeymoon Suite is a uh, great Canadian rock band that I grew up listening to, and you know, uh, terrific guitar player that also has a Godin signature guitar, Derry, I believe his name is, and um, uh, 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 they're still out there doing it. And so, good on them. That's awesome. You're listening to them. Uh, do you still have this this striped Converse? I do, and they're a little small, but they fit. I can wear them. And they're cool. I wear them every now and then. Uh, yeah, yeah. EVH give you a pedal <laughs> and then immediately try to sell it. No, I mean, it's, it's my wall. I'm going to keep it and use it. <laughs> no, I don't, don't have any interest in selling things that are gifts from. I can't. I'm terrible about selling anything. So it's like uh, gifts from, you know, that have some sort of sentimental. No. Not going to do that. I'm going to keep them and use them. I'll wear the shoes and play the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What else we got here? Uh, I think Pete is top YouTube player out there. Hey, thanks. There's so many good, you know, I was watching Ben Eller's video this morning for the 5150 riff. He does terrific stuff. There's so many good YouTube uh, folks. Oh, the Caddis link doesn't work. Okay, I'll fix it. Thank you. That's it for the glasses that I've got. Um, yeah, I could uh, give you the uh, the the link to the website, though. Um, I think it's just caddislife.com. And uh, they make really nice reading glasses. This is this company that, you know, it's down in the... I'll, I'll change that. Um, there, I just put it in the chat if you want to uh, check it out. Do you ever get to jam with Brit? Actually, she she got up and played a whole lot of love with us in uh, was it Guildford, I think, in uh, in the UK. You can watch a whole lot of love with Brit Bowman if you look for it on YouTube. That was a fun jam. We had fun. We had fun. Uh, uh huh. Uh -huh. How much practice time per day would you put in on the guitar? Well, I don't get to practice enough. Having issues with practice and how much time to spend, what to practice, how do you practice? Man, everybody's different, but I would say, I don't know if I have a great perspective on this, to be honest. You know, everybody's different. And I used to use the the most effective practicing I did or when I probably made the most leaps and bounds improvements was when I was using the old videos in the 80s, like the Paul Gilbert or Steve Morse, you know, Starlicks, you know, those types of videos. And I would because I could see them um, and follow along and hear, you know, it was like the whole combination just kind of clicked for me of having video and audio. So, but there's so many great courses and stuff now. I mean, you can join like the Paul Gilbert, you know, online guitar Academy thing, or, you know, like the, uh, the Tim Pierce um, studio guitar masterclass stuff and tons of great advice on there. You probably just want to sign up for some of those. And then, Try and, you know, set aside an hour a day or something like that. Another piece of great advice that that Tim gave in a video that I thought was really relevant was 
he, he's like, when you're watching these types of things, you know, whether it's from him or anyone else, he's like, just try and take one thing away from it every day. You know, like if all you get is one little lick or one move or one concept, that's enough, you know, that because you can get overwhelmed with the amount of information that's out there. So, but <clears throat> everybody's, uh, everybody's different when it comes to practice, you know, on what to spend time on, you know. I think it's really important to have great vibrato and bend technique. So to sit there and just work on that, which is something you can almost do while you're watching television or something, you know, hitting, say, the A on the high E string on the fifth fret and then bending the eighth fret of the B from G up to A and just matching that pitch and holding it there and then giving it a little vibrato. And if you if it doesn't sound good, if it doesn't sound like when your heroes do it, you know, keep working on it. Just build that strength, you know, little things like that, you know, over time. That's important to me, you know, to not have like a nervous vibrato. Some people never seem to get there, you know. It's like, it's like, man, work that out because that's your voice. That's where, and it'll make you sound like a good guitar player or kind of a not so good guitar player if you don't have that together. So that's an important one. Like things like that matter so much more than how fast you can play or, or whatever. You know, really, if you can make the thing speak and sing, it's really important. Yeah. Um. Lauren says, Phil X just posted on Facebook his birthday present from his drill mates. <laughs> a Disney style, that's his band, Disney style cartoon of him playing as SG. That's awesome. Happy birthday to Phil X. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Chris Quinn says, maybe a JTM 45 with some cap selector switches, not just bright cap. 0.022 to 0.0022. These are the caps that go between stages. Um, coupling caps, they call them, to go between the various stages in the preamp. And what happens in preamps of amps is you have to filter, you know, you have to kind of tune them and the amount of signal that goes through and the frequency. And so the caps that are, that are, are uh, that Chris is talking about here are, are coupling caps that will take away more or less bass, you know, depending on the value. And they'll leave the front end fatter or a little thinner. You know, you might think fatter is better. Not always. You know, uh, the more gain, the more you turn up the amp, the more you, if you want to stay tight at all, you got to kind of filter some of that stuff out. So, but not giving too much away, but these are some, you know, when it comes to the PT-50, some things we're considering. So, uh, I want to be able to, you know, dial things in like that on the, on the amplifier. So, not just brights and, and gain, but actually the you know, the kind of some of the stuff you're talking about, Chris. So we will see. Uh, all right. Um, question. A lot of the new modeling and other digital, digital, little bit of digital emulation is uh, stereo, but PAs are mono. N not all PAs are mono. I mean, a lot of PAs are stereo, you know, so just depends where you're playing and stuff. But yeah, you're not going to hear it if it's mono PA and it probably might even collapse and sound weird if you've got stereo effects going on and stuff. So that's something to be aware of. <clears throat> Although, um, in my experience, but I'm, you know, I'm playing, I guess, bigger places in theaters and stuff, but I'm generally dealing with stereo PAs. Um, I guess if you've got us, I don't know that a lot of PAs are mono. Are they? Like even tiny ones for clubs and stuff. I mean, there's there a lot of sort of, you know, powered speakers or you know i mean most mixers are stereo so like even if it's two speakers on sticks you know and they're powered <laughs> you know that kind of pa uh those are that's stereo if you just send it a you know out of a little mackie mixer or something you can that's stereo so i don't know uh i can't remember kind of the last time even in a club that i would have encountered a, a mono pa to be honest but yeah uh, I guess it happens. Did you capture that train wreck amp? Not really. Um, I when I had it here, I did make a uh, like a uh, an attempt to kind of see. Like, I wonder how close you can get. Like, and I so I did something. I had a little experiment, but it and it it kind of you know. The, here's the thing with capturing. It's like the thing with a train wreck is it's alive in the room. So part of it is like a comet. I don't really even use my Comet that much in here and stuff because I've got a cab in the other room. The magic of the Comet is really having the cab in the same room 
and the way that the guitar reacts to it and all the feedback and stuff. And that's the magic of the train wreck too, is that it's, that's why when I did the train wreck video, I had the cabinet in here, which I normally don't do. And it was brilliant. I, I, the amp just came out, you can hear it in the video. It's just alive, right? Um, well, the second that you try and capture that and then maybe put it in a quad cortex or something, you might get the tone, but you're not going to get any of that magic. You know, if you're just plugging direct through, it's, this is, you know, one of the major things that I don't like about uh, the whole direct concept and not having an amp on stage and stuff is you completely cut off that. You just neutered your, you know, that whole guitar amp feedback circuit that is so magical. Um, so, uh, but, and, and then you can do a direct capture, sure, and then run into a power amp, but it, you know, which, yeah, I, I experimented a little bit with that, and it was kind of neat, but it was like, no, the amp is still, uh, capturing is amazing, and I mean, the quad and stuff, and for a lot of purposes, it works great, but if you, if you want that guitar amp cabinet interaction, and it's a beautiful old tube amp, I would say that it's not there yet, where, you know, something like that train wreck was incredible, which is why they're 50 grand, you know, but was really off the, the charts as far as like the how alive it is it's one thing about the train wreck the preamp is like whatever's going on like but they are so touch sensitive and like there's a lot of harmonics and and just like you barely have to touch the guitar and, and it'll start taking off into feedback and it's it's kind of wild it's it's very 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 alive sounding you know super crazy with the dynamics and when you change pickups and all that it's just it's like hyper like guitar or something i don't know how to describe it but it's pretty wild um okay what else we got here let's see is there much of a difference between a stir standard and a stir classic s well it's mainly the body shape you know so the standard has the the slightly it's like a seven eighths body i guess you know and it, and uh uh, sharper edges. So it just depends what you, it's more a look thing than anything. I wouldn't say that you, if you had two Sir guitars and they were, you know, exactly the same other than the, the classic S or the standard body shape, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference in a blind test, you know, and you know, it just feels a little different. It looks a little different. I like them both. Uh, just reading here. Um, have you seen the R2R? electric wah where it has the components in a separate box from the expression i haven't uh you can do that with a crybaby rack you know sounds similar where it's just an expression pedal and then the it's a similar thing <coughs> um you can set the dial to a cocked wah i mean there's other pedals out that do that where you can just kind of set the, the control you know and then it's fixed uh but i haven't seen that particular one though uh let's see here mike with a big old super chat thank you man appreciate that appreciate all who do great covers of van halen songs but van halen's one of those bands that you gotta love the deep cuts more than the radio songs agreed what van halen song you never hear covered would you want to cover i mean there's so many dude when I, uh, dirty movies is one of my favorites because it's like such incredible slide playing i think it's such a neat part and the the pre-chorus is unbelievable the chords and the way it moves and then the little solo section i mean it's such a great piece of music little guitars um never seen a band play little guitars i don't think uh this, i mean i i love a lot of the deep cuts you know i did hang them high with um my friends glenn sobel and at the at the uh, the lucky strike once that was super fun i've never seen anybody else play hang them high live and we did it uh it's on youtube i think um we did the whole first side i think of diver down one night so there's a lot of those on youtube i did i did cathedral and the whole nine yards it was really fun if you look up lucky strike pete thorne van halen it'll pop up and um singer with eric dover too he was amazing he kills that stuff um but yeah like i love all that you know it's funny the diver down like for being the kind of like the uh you know ugly little sister or something of like you know i don't know it's just not the album people talk about and it was i don't know that eddie was happy and all that but holy shit there's some good songs on that record you know it's a super short record but there's three or four tracks that are like primo 
Primo. Love it. Um, yeah. Uh, Cage Seven Tiger says, thanks for the super chat again there, Mike. Uh, and Cage Seven Tiger, thanks for yours. Hey, buddy, got early 90s. PRS CE. Oh, you know the one. Yes, I still have it. Oh, it's you. <laughs> How you doing, man? Um, that's my... I've only owned one of two PRS, and you, sir, ended up with with one of them. So it's an alder body with a maple top. Remember the guitar well. Uh, cherry sunburst, you know, yellow to red kind of cherry sunburst. It was one of those PRS Cs, 25-inch scale, rosewood board, maple neck. Nice guitar, man. You still have it. That's awesome. It was a good, good guitar. Uh, I had that, and then I had a McCarty a few years after that. And I don't honestly remember what happened to the McCarty. I don't remember where I sold it or where it went. Like most of my gear, I'm like, where did that thing end up? Uh, but I did sell it eventually. And uh, but that, uh, nice to hear from you. What's happening? Um, can't multiple pieces of the same wood also sound noticeably different? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's all about weight and density and stuff like that, you know, probably that's probably got a lot of the difference, you know, so. Uh, okay. Um, let's see, not to blow smoke, I think yourself or Phil X would have been a better choice for Sammy Hager's Van Halen gig. No disrespect. I think he'll do a great job. Um, you know, he's a legend, man. He was one of my biggest influences, Joe Satriani. So, and he's a, he's a good, good dude. And he was, he's a hard worker. Like he'll have it together. It'll be great. I think that the, you know, the only thing I'll say about it, they would probably concur, but the, 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 the thing about Van Halen, um, is that, and it's why when I go to do it, I don't take a modeler or something and go do it. I have like when, it, okay. If you go watch that lucky strike gig that I did with, with Glenn, I've got my SL68 there and I, you know, I didn't use the house amp. The house amps are Friedman's. They're great. I could have totally done it. I brought my SL68 and probably had a phase 90 and whatever, but you know, the board, I had this stuff, all the stuff. And I remember when I played that, uh, cause lucky strike is like a, it's a bowling alley here in LA, but they've got a, uh, it's a live music venue too. And they've got a great scene there. And occasionally they do these, you know, it was where uh, actually uh, Steve Vai, Billy Sheehan, Greg Bissonette got together to do the Roth Band reunion uh, a number of years ago. And it never happened, even though they were all in the room because the fire marshal shut the place down because it was so packed. So it's the same venue. But anyway, so they do these kind of curated nights or whatever sometimes. And, and so we got up and did the whole first half of Diver Down. So I took the SL68 and I remember the they, you know like kid that worked there or whatever on stage like i played two chords or whatever and he's like oh you're gonna have to turn that down i was like nope <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna happen you know and uh i wonder if it's on let me see if i can find the video and i'll post it in the in the uh let me see i'll find it uh because this is all pulling me around to say there's no half-assing van halen like you can't uh you you, you kind of have to go all the way with it if you want it to sound right and everything. So that's all I think that, um, you know, the, the, the problem that you run into if you go on an early morning TV show, as they did, you know, and play like in a studio like that and with headphones and stuff like that is that it, it doesn't have the same effect, you know, as, yeah, you can do it and you can play. I mean, these guys are legends, you know, but there's only kind of one way to nail the experience which is it has to be bombastic and loud and drums and amps and the whole thing you know it just has to be right it, it makes sense right so uh it's 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 that's that's the only thing where i would say okay i wish they'd just done kind of an arena thing and videoed it or something and then thrown it up on youtube and been like you know what i mean like it, it's almost got to be live without a net like for it to have the and then we all would have gone oh my god that's awesome i think you know it's not that they can't, they're, they're, they're legends, you know? Um, but when you, I, I'm on such a terror about the whole direct thing and I mean, I, I'm not anti-modeling and all that. You guys know that, you know, but it's like, there's no way to capture the vibe of a Van Halen thing without having all the stuff and the volume and the, you know, the drums and the everything just thundering through a PA. 
and you know get up everybody up like that whole thing you know is that's the and you can't you can't bottle it or or di condense it down to something where it's it's different you know uh let me see here lucky strike let me see if i can find this video of us doing this and then i'll uh yeah no i haven't found it yet um hmm, that's interesting i don't see it i know it's i know it's up here because i've seen it but uh uh Lucky strike, oh, uh, Glenn Sobel, Van Halen, Diver Down. Oh, here's one. Um, yeah, so I don't know if it's just random clips or whatever. Or, or let's see, Diver Down. It, it's, it's not listed uh, as the song title. That's the thing. It just says Diver Down. Um, and then there's a bunch of individual little videos here. So I'm not sure which is which, but it was a guy named Concertologist. And you can find the, uh, you can find them on there. All right. So let me just, the big, the, there's one with 4,000 views here or something. Maybe that's the, just click on it. A Mervo is for sure. Here's the, uh, the video. I'm going to put it down in the chat. If you want to watch it, there's one of them. And then you can find the other ones from there. But anyway, yeah, just take the amp, turn it up, 100 watts, play loud, the whole nine yards. And that's the only way to do it, you know. I, I Sammy, ha you know, he's not a, 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 you know, he's a smart guy, Sammy Hagar, and Joe Satriani's a legend, and so it's uh, they're gonna, it's gonna be great, you know, when they go do it with amps and play loud and all that stuff. I, th it'll be really fun, I'm sure, you know. Um. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see the Music Man. That's right here. Um. We've got it sitting here. So there it is. Flame Top from, no, I think it's 93, this one. 92 or 90. Maybe it was made in 92. I guess the the uh, the serial numbers are a little bit, um, you know, they're not consecutive. I, so you can't, you got to kind of contact Dirty Ball with the serial number to know exactly when it was made. But anyway. Uh, yeah. I was once was told by a Fender rep that wood didn't make a difference. Well, that's the difference between the guy building the guitars and the guy selling the guitars. Sometimes <laughs> wood totally makes a difference. You can ask Sir, and he'll tell you. I mean, he's the one of the most legendary guitar builders on earth at this point, and he's going to tell you that of course it makes a difference. So I'll go with what he says. You know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you like 70s Jethro Tull? You know, I've, I've never listened to them. I listened to them a little bit right when I first started um, getting into music. And now I have Martin, you know, I know he's very influential um, to a lot of people. And I know Holly Henderson, who, you know, I made a record with years ago and stuff. She's really into Martin and Jethro Tull. So I should just spend some more time and listen. But I can't say that I know their music that well, you know. Uh but I used to listen a little bit, right? When I was eleven, and I, I, I was like Jethro Tull. There was one record that a friend of mine had that I would listen to and stuff. And uh, what was that song "Bumble in the Jungle" or something, something like that? I remember that's all right by me. That's still in my head <laughs> from when I was ten years old. Maybe I've got the title wrong. I don't. Know. What's your favorite '80s rock band? Well, Dan Halen. <laughs> Or other other eighties bands. I mean, I love a lot of eighties stuff. Here's the thing: in the eighties, I loved um, primarily. I would say I was sixty five percent a hard rock guy, you know. So I loved, you know, Van Halen and Rat and uh, and you know all that stuff. Def Leppard. I love Def Leppard in the eighties. You know, great. I mean, they made great records and cool tune, catchy tunes and stuff like that. But I also loved the Pretenders. You know, I also loved In Excess. Um, you know, uh, those bands made such great music, you know, and then, uh, yeah, Dire Straits. And um, uh, I mean, I remember just listening to a ton of stuff then, 
you know, um, Tom Petty, I loved, you know, Henley, I loved in the 80s, you know, I loved like his solo stuff, because that's what I would hear, you know, Boys of Summer and Sunset Grill and all those great songs. Um, and so I listened to everything, you know, I was a hard rock guy, ACDC, Van Halen, you know, Def Leppard, all that stuff. I really loved all that stuff. Thin Lizzy, Meta early Metallica. Um, loved it. But, uh, but um, you know, beyond all that, um, yeah, I just loved, you know, Prince and, and like I say, in excess and, you know, um, psychedelic furs, they sounded cool to me, you know. Uh, I, so there was, a, there was a lot of great, different great music coming out that I was also aware of that wasn't, you know, hard rock or from LA or whatever, you know? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Eston says, hello, Pete and all you guitar folks. Hey to you. How are you? Uh, okay. Um, what else we got here? see um arthur says uh that he definitely doesn't feel like he can emulate the artists who have influenced him good sounding like himself but playing covers in the ballpark yeah i mean that's most people i think and that's good you know it's more probably more interesting and more important long term to sound like you you know my th my thing of sounding like other people are trying to nail things has you know worked well for me in my sideman career that's all i'll say you know that's part of my i'm not you know like i don't consider myself some amazing guitar player you know but i do consider myself i know one of my skill sets is being able to get the tones and play the parts right right you know, so I always say it's like being an actor and you're delivering a line when you're playing someone else's stuff. And that's kind of the name of the game. I would say 80% of the time as a sideman, some, sometimes sidemen, people want you to come in and do your own thing. 80% of the time they want you to play the record and, and then maybe embellish here and there, you know? So the getting really, 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 really close, uh, to the sounds and the parts and everything has worked well for me in my sideman career. Because that's the majority of the money and that I've made in the music business or whatever the work that I've done over the years was as a sideman, so playing with singers, you know, uh, and you know, getting the sounds and all that. Uh, yeah, okay. I I think I'm probably pretty far back in the chat here. I should move down, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Isn't Lurkst Alex Lifeson's nickname? Yeah, I believe so. That's his. They they all had uh, names, didn't they? Call him Neil the Professor or something. I don't know. And his was Lurkst. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that's true. What are my thoughts on Mercury Magnetic Transformers in a Marshall? Um, I'll just say my favorites are Haber so far that I've tried. Um, the Haber Company, I think, makes great transformers and they're what i want to hear um having tried uh you know switching between multiple different transformers john sir built this thing where we could switch between two transformers and listen a b like directly it's amazing because normally it takes 15 minutes even for an experienced tech to swap out a transformer so by then your ears have gone out the window unless you've recorded the amp or something then you can pair the recordings i mean but just back and forth um we could use this to, to actually switch between transformers. So when we did the PT-100 and selected a transformer, uh, we did that. Oh, well, there he is. Look at him. There he is. He's here in the chat, didn't we, John? That's exactly what we did, if you're still here. Uh, but it it and, and it was interesting, because I think John and I both heard the same thing when we were listening to transformers. Like, we kind of would have, it's like, oh, yeah, I like this one or like that that one. So we ended up with a uh, Dagnall... 1.5 inch stack transformer the plexi style you know like a 67 or 68 this is a transformer is about this big that's why i'm doing this uh that's the one that we ended up liking over everything and we listened to some mercuries we listened to you know the the uh kind of uh sort of readily available and less expensive um hammond one was pretty good too and they're not they're not a lot of money but just haber is a you know and they make a good product, I think, and we both like those. So that's my favorite. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. What else we got here? I'm so far back in the chat, so I'm moving down. Um, Simon, what's up? How are you, dude? The Music Man, oh, you've got the date. Of course you do. The Music Man guitar was manufactured on February 24th, 1993, and the color is translucent gold straight off the Ernie Ball database. That's awesome. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate that. February 24th, 93. That's excellent. Thank you for the info. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, the video has got a lot of views. It uh, it really took off. And uh, Simon, I had a good talk uh, on the on the telephone last night with Sterling Ball as well, who kind of you know we just he, he just wanted to speak to me after he saw the video, and um, I think I got most of the information correct <laughs> in the video. Uh, the only thing I kind of I, I, like Dudley, one of the designers there, I I, I, I should have probably mentioned him. Um, and Steve Blitter from DeMarzio as well. There's a couple people that I didn't mention. I probably could have, but anyways, if you dig deeper, you'll, you'll find out all the, all the stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, Simon, the video was all, it's all due to you. It's all possible because, you know, you made the connection and I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the super chat. Wild that people disrespect Satch. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, you know, it's okay to, I guess, criticize things, but he's a legend, you know. Dude is a legend, and he, you know, like I say, he, I have a lot of respect for him and his, um, his, uh, I mean, you know, there's not many people, not even Van Halen, that have um, connected like he did with radio. Uh, like in the late 80s, we got to keep in mind, you know, Satch Boogie or Summer Song, those songs, um, uh, Always With Me, Always With You. This guy had hits on the radio <laughs> with instrumental guitar songs. Cliffs of Dover was one of the only other ones that you'll hear on classic rock radio. Um, you can count on one hand the amount of guys that have, that have had that impact, like Joe did. And Joe went on tour. And I saw him play, you know, it was a 5,000 seater in, in Edmonton in 1988 or 89, something like that, on the tour for, I don't know if it was Flying in a Blue Dream or Surfing with the Alien, I think. But he was on tour with Stu Ham and Jonathan Mover, I think, on drums and playing big venues, playing instrumental guitar. Like before him, Jeff Beck did it. But I mean, there's, that was a different kind of music almost. It was, it's like, the guy that connected with, you know, for like rock hits on commercial rock radio and actually went platinum, you know, uh, with surfing um, was Joe. And you, you can count the amount of people that have done that literally on one hand, you know. So he's he's a legend of uh, guitar, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And the way that he, the, the, the beauty that uh, of what he did and, and it kind of his, his secret, you know, I think was that he, was able to have an arc in his songs that were like pop song arc, you know, where he started slow enough and roped you in with something cool. Then he played a melody, you know, then he did the same melody with a little bit of embellishment, maybe moving it up an octave. And then, you know, and he built like really in a beautiful way with, with the way that he played instrumental guitar pieces. I say instrument, I mean, you know what I mean? Like no vocals. So, um, it was like you didn't miss the singer, you know. He he had a, a a style that he did that that he kind of pioneered in in the sense of it was classic rock or sort of traditional pop rock song structure. It was a little, you know, when we think about um, Jeff Beck doing, uh, I guess I don't know, Freeway Jam or, or doing because um, we've ended as lovers. It was like that, like where he was the singer. And it was beautiful, you know, when he played. And then, sure, there'd be a solo somewhere in the song where they'd burn a little bit and stuff, you know. But the majority of it was he was playing a melody like a singer. And that was Joe's secret. The way he was able to do that in kind of a simple pop song form, it was very accessible and nice to listen to and, like, had an effect on the listener that was like, I like this song. Just like you would like a whatever song by your favorite band, you know. It, it um, I'm not saying it wasn't challenging or whatever to listen to, but there was a simplicity to it that I liked, you know, that because 
I maybe I'm not that sophisticated. I'm not a jazz guy, really. I'm not that sophisticated. Like I don't I, I like some sophistication and little twists and things. We take always with me, always with you. It's this beautiful major melody, but when he does the one part in the middle, kind of the bridge, it's minor. That's a little twist to me. It's like, oh, it goes somewhere else here emotionally for a second. That was cool, you know. But it wasn't like too many notes or like I wasn't getting lost or losing interest or, you know, running out of, uh, you know, when somebody like, you know, shoots their water or whatever, like, you know, when by 30 seconds in, you're like, okay, that's a lot of notes. Wow, it's amazing, but I'm already tuning out. He never uh, had that, you know. So, uh, he always was able to hold interest and stuff. So it's, it's really interesting, you know. Um, he's great at it. So I got great respect for Joe. You know, in my clinics that I've done, I use him as an example of how to um, build momentum and hold hold the listener's interest and stuff like that when you're coming up with instrumental guitar. So, yeah. We live in a little bit of a different age now, but, um, uh, you know, with shortened attention spans and all that. But I still think a lot of those same rules, it's just applies you know john's talking about pickups v60s or 63s i use v63 now i love those uh what else are you guys talking about here earl says simon's with us yeah i know it's awesome fantastic that diver down sound check sounded good uh it was actually they call it sound check live uh, but so I, I, I assume that's the show that's, I haven't even looked at the video that I posted, but, um, we did, as I remember, we did hang them high. We did, uh, I can't remember what songs we played to be honest, but it's the pretty much the first side of Diver Down. I think that we did. I remember doing cathedral and hang them high right now. And I can't remember what else we played to be honest, but yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, <clears throat> How is the neck on the Ernie Ball Music Man? It's quite a small neck. Is it easy to play like a Sir? It's a 10-inch radius, um, so kind of a vintage radius almost. You can almost see the board, like how curved it is, if you look at the fingerboard. Um, the neck... Uh, it's listed as one and five eighths on the Music Man site. Somebody online said one and nine sixteenths. Somebody gave me shit in the comments for not actually just measuring myself. They were like, so like, I don't understand why Pete doesn't just measure it. He's infuriating sometimes. <laughs> I don't have a ruler in here. I actually don't. So it's like, you know, but it feels a little smaller than one and five eighths to me, to be honest. This guitar, let me see. This guitar is one. Well, I guess it's it's so damn close. Maybe there's just one and five eighths. That's what it's listed as on the site. Somebody said one and nine sixteenths. Keep in mind, I grew up in Canada with a metric system, so I don't understand the difference between one and five eighths and nine sixteenths because I didn't grow up with it. I grew up with, I hate those fractions. <laughs> I like millimeters, for God's sakes, for all you folks over there in Europe, you understand. You're, you're going, yes, yes. But um, anyways, um, what else about the neck? 10-inch radius, kind of narrow. I know when they moved to, to calling it the axis and just releasing it as a standard line guitar, they actually widened the neck at the heel end a little bit so that the neck tapers out a little bit because people were complaining that the high E string falls off the fingerboard sometimes. So that's actually a thing with with the guitar. So it is quite a, quite a narrow, but that's what he wanted. That's what was on the 5150 guitar. I find it very interesting because, you know, Eddie played pretty wide necks early on. I mean, it was one and three quarters, I think, the original that uh, sort of CBS headstock that was on the Frankenstrat back in 77, 78. That's a really, really wide neck that was on that guitar. One and three quarters, I think. So he went all the way from that to uh, this smaller neck, you know. He moved around. The latest uh, Wolfgang guitars that I've played, because I've got one up there, uh, 2009. Uh, and it's a little wider than the Music Man, for sure. But the latest Wolfgang guitars are even wider. I swear they're one and eleven sixteenths or something, you know, because I played one a little while ago. It's a friend. It's like, this is a much wider neck and bigger frets. It's like they went back to bigger frets. So he was just always moving around doing different different stuff. I don't think it's stainless frets. I think it's just nickel frets. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I don't think 
they had. I'm 99% sure. I don't think they had stainless steel frets as a thing in 1993 or four. John, do you, when did you start using stainless steel or become aware of it? Cause I don't even think it was, was around. Um, here's John speaking to Woods. I built guitars out of structural foam and Knopfler just sold one for 45 K maybe not so much tonal, but response attack and sustain. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I find I mean, there's absolutely no question in my mind that, uh, I've got a hard ash Frankie style thing here with a maple neck. I've also got, you know, the EVH Frankie style. That's basswood. That's the, the wood. If they both have Floyd's and they're both a maple neck bolted on a guitar. The wood sounds different and it comes through the pickup. It's like, I don't know how to describe it other than just to say one guitar sounds bright and hard. And it sounds like that when you plug it in, it's bright, hard, and fast. The basswood guitar sounds softer. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if dollars is the right word, but through gain, it's warmer and the attack is spongier. It just is, you know, and, and it all sounds, it sounds like that when you play it acoustically, you know, I could go get the guitars right now and through this microphone, you'd hear the difference. And then it just comes out of the pickup sounding like that too. I mean, I'm not crazy. I know the guitars don't sound the same, you know, and it's not the pickup. Pickup, of course it matters, but it's like everything matters. It's a formula. We got 494 people online. Let's get six more here and get over the 500 mark. Come on. I don't know. Phone a friend or something and say, can you sign on for a minute so that Pete stops uh, complaining? I'm not complaining. I'm happy to be here. I am happy to be here. Uh, you got to listen to more non-guitar music. Is that me? Dude, I listen to all kinds of non-guitar music. I mean, I went through a phase in the... Um, well, first of all, in the early 90s, when, you know, kind of hair rock died and all that, I went through my singer songwriter phase hardcore where I was listening to Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. And uh, not that that's not guitar music. They play guitars. But uh, and then you know, around 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, I got into major like electronic music. Like I was listening to, you know, just chill out. No mid range. <laughs> Zero seven, you know, more Chiba. Uh, I really, you know, Massive Attack, Air. I love Air. I was That's what I was listening to, you know? And I still listen to stuff like that sometimes. I love it. I'm all over the map, man. So, uh, it's amazing that you make the assumption about me that I wouldn't listen to that. Because <laughs> I wouldn't assume that about you. There is Matt Beckley. He's a longtime caller, but uh, occasional listener. He says, I had to borrow a Kempo from Rod Castro, our buddy Rod, for a gig I've got tomorrow. And it turns out all his profiles from the PT-15 IR sound awesome. You know, the camper weighs just as much as the amp. Why doesn't he just take the amp? I don't understand. You kids in your campers. I, I'm just kidding. I get it. I get it. I know the campers. I get it. Or maybe it's a floorboard one. In which case, I get it even more because then you can switch presets and all that. Oh, brother. Uh, let's see here. Oh, cool. Uh, Ray says uh, 2105. Of course, that's 0521 if you're in America. 78, Newcastle, UK. Newcastle, home of rock and roll. Rock City. You spent a lot of time in Rock City growing up, didn't you? You know what I'm talking about. Van Halen loud, very loud and proud. First ever concert. What a show. That's awesome. You know Wayne Banks? <laughs> he's the mayor of newcastle oh man rock city's this legendary rock club in newcastle that uh everybody played at and hung out at stuff luke on the tube says john sir it's nice having you here john don't go stay please don't leave uh billy wagner says uh do you find the older you get the harder it is to keep the top end of your chops up no not really actually um I know what you mean. I have to be more careful, I think, about like, you know, overuse kind of injuries. But I don't find that really. No, I, I, if I, oh, we got 505 people online. Come on. Good job, everybody. Thanks for calling your friends. Well, I'll give you that five bucks that I owe you later. Uh, I, I, as long as I just practice and don't push myself beyond, I, I really don't actually. I think I play as good as I ever did or, or at least with more sensitivity to the things that are probably important than I ever did, you know, as I get older. So I feel, I still feel good about my playing. I've had less problems actually with my hand and, um, I have a, uh, thyroid thing, Hashimoto's 
uh, and you know, so I have to take uh, medication for that. And I, I, there was a time before I was medicating, you know, taking the the because it's like th the thyroid is your master gland that controls everything, right? And I, I think I was like, uh, you know, having this problem, and I think it was affecting my hands actually, and uh, affecting like uh, nerves. And um, I don't know if anybody else has ever had that, but I was getting kind of, some kind of like more issues with my left and my right hand actually than I'd ever had. And this this is going back a little over ten years ago. Once I kind of dealt with that and realized what was going on, uh, I think my, I think things got better actually. So I think I'm actually better off now than I was even ten years ago when it comes to or or twelve years ago when I discovered that little issue that I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pete, uh, Pete's just figuring out that Sarah's in the chat. Yeah, exactly. I know. Well, I, I get caught up sometimes reading questions because, you know, the, the whole thing is there's, uh, uh, you know, I get, you guys ask good questions and I want to I want to answer them. And then I go off on tangents and then you're asking more and more and more. And I just, I gotta, I gotta go faster, I guess. It's my fault. I accept responsibility. Um, yeah. I replaced the blown, blown Drake transformer in my Marshall build with a Mojitone or Haybor. No complaints. Um, also have a JTM 45 with a big fancy Mercury because my techs like some. There's less difference than you might think. I mean, they make a difference for sure. But as with everything, it's a sum of the parts. So, yeah. Uh, when you're getting that Sir Dark Charcoal back in your studio, not till after tour because it, it, it's on a... Uh, you know, getting freighted with all our tour gear. So um, all the guitars and my amps and everything are all coming over from England uh, to do the U.S. Classic Rock Show run. Yep. Uh, do you like setting up mics on small speaker cabinets, like a 112? Well, I did it for, I mean, my first record was that, basically with a mic in a closet on a 112. Um I don't mind it at all, you know. Some little one twelves, the Sir one's great. The little Bogner ported one has a really big sound. It's kind of when they, when they made it, um, you know, to sound like a bigger cabinet. Uh, I, I I think you can get a great tone out of those things. Actually, you know, it's interesting. I remember talking with a guy from Celestian that was doing all their impulse responses, and he was talking about how he kind of discovered that he sort of was preferring 112s mic to over 412s. And and the reason, it, it makes sense when you think about it, because there's only one speaker, and you mic it, and then you're getting that sound, and it's not getting like any kind of phasing or weird stuff from other speakers in the cabinet. Because no matter what, if you got a 212 or a 412, all those other speakers are pushing air, but that sound is kind of, some of it's getting into the mic, even though you're close miking with a tight, you know, probably, you know, 57 or something, a hypercardioid, whatever. Certainly if you use a ribbon, it's picking up through the back. And so you're getting more of this kind of reflected sound and stuff and the sound coming out of the other speakers when you're close miking, right? Uh, when you've got more than one speaker. Uh, and it does tend to sound a little more like a 112 just is like a bit more of a laser beam and kind of defined tone through microphones. And then a 412 can sound a little more diffuse. You know, just a little more, a little less defined would be how I would describe it. So, uh, yeah, I remember having that discussion with the fellow at Celestian when he was talking about kind of realizing that and how he was digging the 112s quite a bit. So it might be something you want to try, like try a 112 Celestian IR of a green back or whatever in a 112 closed, and then listen to the 412 one and, and see if you notice a difference in the definition of the tone, especially like in a busy track or something. Maybe you might prefer the 112 for some things. Surfing with the Alien uh, was and still is an outstanding classic album. 100%. It sounds like, you know, like nothing else. It's got its own sound. I know the way they recorded it was, I think, wasn't a lot of it done kind of DI, like maybe Palmer's or something like that. It's got a sound to it. But like with a lot of records, um, I can't imagine it sounding any different. And I wouldn't want it to. Just like uh, 1984 by Van Halen or whatever. Like uh, that's a, an example I use often because it's got the Simmons drums and all that. I wouldn't want it to sound any different. It's a piece of art and it sounds like it sounds and I like it like that. I like Hysteria by Def Leppard because it's got the, the Rockman guitars and the sampled drums and all that. It sounds like that record. And it's like that that's the sound of a, uh, a moment in time and a piece of art. So... Uh, Satch is apparently, says John, a real nice guy, which is super important. I've met him a couple times. Um, he was really nice when I met him. We had a, a exchange online a little while ago. He was actually asking me, he was looking for Les Paul Customs. 
like he was really interested in for recording and stuff. And he's like, what do you think about the difference between Les Paul Customs and standards? What do you think the difference is? So we had this nice back and forth about it. And he contacted me to ask me that. And I was uh, honored, you know, to chat with him about it for a minute. I told him about my custom that, I, well, all I can speak to is my experience with, you know, Ebony board and this heavy sort of 10 pound custom I have, but it's got a depth to it and a different kind of, you know, kind of solid solidity uh, to the tone or something over, you know, say my R9s or other Les Paul kind of lighter guitars that are, you know, a little more airy. And, you know, the, 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 I always say my custom is like the rock machine, you know, it's a little more defined and once again, definition, a little more depth in the tone. So we, I just told him that and I'm not sure what he ended up with as far as a guitar, but it was a nice chat. And he, he's just a, he seems like a really nice, soft-spoken, hardworking guy. Hey, come on. How many people, I mean, 87, well, he put out Not of This Earth, uh, was that 85 or six or something like that? I don't know. I might be getting the years wrong, but the dude has been a professional guitar player since the late seventies, early eighties. And he's still working and putting out records and doing G3 and putting out, I mean, he's, the, he's a legend, man. He's, he's got a long, 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 long career behind him and hopefully much more in front of him as well. And, um, that's what you want, you know, is to keep working and stay out there and do it. And it's like, you know, so respect for Joe. <clears throat> respect. Satriani equals musicality. I agree. He's, he's very musical. I like his style and I like his, you know, I like, uh, I don't know. I like his sounds. I like, I got nothing to, nothing bad to say about that dude at all. I really liked the album he did with, with Andy Johns, um, which was the extremist. What a great sounding record, you know, and a live band, the drums and everything. And it's funny because around the same time he did, uh, you know, similar era was the, the Van Halen record of the, the carnal knowledge album and it's got a very very similar sonic you know just just sounds like a great band rocking out it's awesome yeah okay uh what else we got here uh all right looking through the chat how are you coming with Stella by Starlight? Oh, it's going great. Uh, I think I'll, I'll I'll have it within a couple of weeks. Um, it has become cool to trash Satriani and Vi online in recent years. I I don't know. I I, I think I, you know. Have you guys seen that whole U two dispute? Like where people are talking about U two and kind of trashing them too. It's like a it's like something happens when you stick around long enough to become legendary. And then like, there's this certain contingent of people that just, I don't know if it's overexposure or what, you know, I guess there's the danger of it, you know, of being overexposed or whatever, but you know what? Screw all that. Cause like Joe's out, of, you know, he's touring right now and he's, there's tons of people there watching him play and you two just did sold out the sphere and had, you know, create, it's just like the more hate you get, the more you're famous and actually doing well or something, you know, so screw it, you know, who cares? I don't know. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like, it's just this, uh, you know, that, you know, the dickheads online tend to make a lot of noise. That's all, you know, and then people take notice cause it's, you know, they're trying to be counterculture or something or be, um, and it's just kind of like, it's rude and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just kind of, you know, people just trying to get a rise, I guess. And that gets, that gets traction or whatever, because of human nature, I guess, but it, it actually doesn't have any bearing or, uh, effect on their actual popularity. I don't think, you know, if anything, that just means they are popular. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. This is true too. Uh, the other side of the Sammy should pick someone besides Satch things. They have established history. Hundred percent. That's where I met Joe, and had you know I was at a Chickenfoot show. <laughs> we were playing with Chickenfoot in uh, in Austria, and I met all those guys. That's my great you know Sammy Hagar story that I love to tell about uh, introducing him to Cornell. <laughs> you know, it was the same within the same hour or whatever that I got to meet Joe and uh and and michael anthony and all that good stuff and it was mike's birthday and 
Mike drank Jack on stage out of the bottle while we were standing on side stage. It was like, oh, man, I haven't seen that since Van Halen days. <laughs> you know, all that good stuff. But, um, and I, I really liked Sammy, you know, meeting him. He was so cool. Um, I brought him, I, I've told the story before, but it was super quick. I brought him down to Cornell's dressing room because he's like, he's like, I'd love to meet him. I'm like, come on. So I took him down to the dressing room and uh, I, you know, the door was just cracked open. He looked inside. He goes, oh, he's in there. He's, he's, he's singing to his wife and he was just warming up. He used to just play. And then, it's, you know, Vicky was sitting there on the couch or something. And I go, dude, you got to just go in there and be like, hey, what's up? You know, and he'll go, no, no, no. He's, he's it's just like me and Sammy Hagar talking. And he goes, he goes, no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to disturb him. And I go, I go, you got to trust me. He's going to love it. Like, just go in there and be like, be like, hey, man. And so he goes, all right. And he opens the door and he goes, hey, fuck, what's going on in here, Cornell? <laughs> he just busted the door open and Chris just looks up and he just starts laughing because, of course, it's Sammy Hagar, you know. And uh, and after the show, I saw Sammy and, and he said, hey, man, thanks for talking me into doing that earlier, you know, in the dressing room. He goes, if he would have had a problem with that, I wouldn't want to be his friend anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know chris is the you know kind of guy that would love that so and i knew that so anyways blah 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 but uh okay let's see uh t -t 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 -t. the neck on the 5150 was a bat compared to the music man i mean but they digitized it so it's like maybe eddie went at the 5150 at some point with a sandpaper or something i don't know you know Dude, I remember one time being at 5150 and the 5150 guitar was hanging on the wall. And I should have just asked, can I see that for one second? But I didn't, you know. Uh, and then I would know better. But, you know, I remember it in the control room there on that. Oh, fuck, there's a 5150 guitar, but I just played it cool. <laughs> you know, uh, crazy. Anyways, blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, Love Zero Seven says Desert Doug. It's great chill out music, man. It's super. And Moon Safari is a class. And Moon Safari is a lovely album. 100%. I love Air. I like Zero Seven. I like to chill out. Stainless Steel, probably somewhere in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, but they were pretty crude. Yeah, I don't. Th I think Ernie Balls were nickel silver frats, not, not Stainless Steel. I don't remember him talking about going to Stainless Steel until after PV, till the. I remember him making a big deal about it actually when he did the EVH guitars, you know, his own brand, and saying like, I, "We're using stainless frets on these, and I've changed to them, and there's absolutely nothing I don't like about them, and they just last and they feel great, and et cetera, et cetera." I remember that then. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Area eight five nine says another great player, Philip Sace, left Fender and is now a PRS player. What is going on at Fender? I don't know if Philip was he ever like a Fender and Dorsey. Like, uh, I just know he had vintage, you know, he's got uh, at least a few super beat, really cool vintage strats. But I don't remember him ever playing new Fenders. He might have, and he might have had a, some sort of endorsement with him, but just not that I remember. Uh, uh, I don't know, you know, business is business. I guess people, you know, forge relationships, they meet people and, hey, would you ever want to? And what if we were to do this for you? And then it happens, you know, probably something along those lines. Uh, I've moved down in the chat here quite far. I'm about an hour and 52 in. I'm going to split relatively soon, go get some work done. I got to get, I'm working on a video for this Donner Prince uh, drive pedal here. So I'm going to get to that in a second, but I'll hang out for another 10 or 15. Okay. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Firewolf says, I started playing guitar at 50 and you're now 59. That's awesome. It's never too late to start. I always tell people that. Uh, can the UA Lion be run into the front of an amp? Sure, you could. I would probably be more inclined to run it into a power amp and it would probably sound pretty darn good like that, I would think. But, um, or like, you know, an effect return of an amp. So you're just getting the power section. But yeah, you could plug it into the front of an amp and just try and EQ the amp to be as flat as possible. Uh, do you find using the 412 is more problematic to use than 212s? Does the extra weight matter? Well, not if I don't have to carry it. No, really. Uh, if I'm lifting a 412, ah, I can do it. I can actually fit one in the back of my car, um, but it's not my favorite thing to do. So I would probably take a 212 if, if I was humping it around. But hey, if it's stage hands and it's in a road case and it rolls in off a truck... I'll take the 412. Yeah, you know what I mean? 
You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? All right. Uh, let's see. Moving down in the chat. Moving down in the chat. Why don't Pete talk about the Sheba Drive? You're trying to get me in trouble with John? I did a video for the Sheba Drive. That's on my channel from 10 years ago, I think. Uh, I think I did the mini Sheba, actually. It's a good sounding pedal. You know? 100%. 100%. My favorite, sir. I mean, I, I really I always recommend the Riot as being a great distortion, but I don't, I'm more of an amp distortion guy, so I don't really use that style of pedal that often. But if you are a clean amp player and you need a good distortion, it's good. My favorite uh, sort of front end kicker pedal that Sir makes is the Cocoa Boost. And more people should know about it and use it because it's badass in front of a, a Marshall or something like that. It's fantastic. What's the ribbon mic you like? Um, well, I've used a few different ones. The VR1 from SE is really nice for not too much money. The Royer R122 is pretty stellar. Um, it's like a 121, but with more air and um, a little more extended top end. First time I used a Royer where I felt like, okay, I could probably use this with no 57 for rock, you know. You can use a 121 by itself if you're playing mellow guitar tones. And it, they even sound fantastic, you know, say in front of a combo or something and backed up like six feet or three feet in front of the amp and it sounds like the amp in the room it's so fantastic you know but if you're trying to get a, a present rock guitar sound in a dense mix <clears throat> you can't just use them by themselves i don't think but a 122 it's got more top end because it's got a preamp in it and it's more extended top and more uh uh yeah uh a little oscars question here best picture oppenheimer or killer of the flower i didn't see killers of the, of the flower moon uh but i saw oppenheimer which was I thought excellent. Uh, yeah, really excellent. So I'd I still have to see the other one. Here's an interesting question. When setting up a SIR with compound radius, using fretboard radius tools and setting up saddles, do you set up for the normal radius around nine or compound? <coughs> That's a great question. I guess you kind of got to set it up for maybe the end of the fingerboard, right? For where the radius ends up. And then it's going to end up with the action being a little different down low, but that's probably a good thing. I don't know, John. What do you think? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. um, Joe Satriani talked about surfing with the alien on a recent video with Rick Beato. He mentioned a broken eventide and using a guitar that wouldn't stay in tune. I think he used the um, uh, a Kramer. And you have a Kramer that he used. It was just like a Kramer with a Floyd that was his kind of main gigging guitar or whatever. On that record, I think. You know, pre-endorsement, pre-Ibanez and stuff. Who are the biggest influencers for you that don't get the recognition? I would say Alex Lifeson, actually, for me, too. Uh, Alex had a big effect on my, you know, chordal, arpeggiated stuff. Kim Mitchell. Um, <clears throat> I had Kim on Sunday Live a while ago, and we're pals now. But, um, you know, when I first got to know him a couple of years ago now, it's probably going back like almost two years, um, he, he had contacted me and we, we connected, and I couldn't believe it because I was, you know, and I had to go back and actually listen to Akimbo Logo, which was his great solo album for the early 80s that kind of put him super on the map as a solo artist defining his you know because he was in a band called max webster before that and had put out some solo songs but akimbo a logo was like a big deal when it came out i went back and listened to that record and i know every note every drum fill everything off that record but i put it on in the car i hadn't listened to it in years and it just all came back to me as i was playing it and i just knew everything and it was like wow this you know sometimes like you forget like who your big influences are not forget but like when you when i listened to it i was like oh my god like i this had a you know my uh and his phrasing and everything there's it it's funny because in the interview i mentioned a couple songs like uh caroline and uh uh called off 
on that record, which is a beautiful, uh, heavy, depressing sort of song. But it's a some it's a ballad, but it's like a you know it's about a, a relationship ending. And that song had such a it's it's got a real beautiful bluesy emotional solo on it, and the phrasing in it and the space in that solo I realized had a big effect on me. Um, and it was you know all these things feed into your your uh your psyche and you know they they, f they form who you are and i was probably only you know 13 years old or something when i was listening to that but that kind of emotional you know the space and the the bends and the phrasing and what how he was speaking through the guitar that had a big effect on me so i, I realized that he was a big big one for me it's all these canadian folks kim and kim and uh alex for sure you know and those guys are buds so Brings, bringing it all home. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. What else we got? Uh, anyone have an old Bogner Shiva 112 combo? Jeez, I don't know that much about those. <coughs> um. I know you use transcribe to learn songs, but how did you learn the second guitar parts and bits that are buried? That's how you, you, uh, you're saying your ears are rabbit level perspective. You just have to dig in. And we said, like, I tried to develop my ear so that it could go into the track and grab the part and pull it out. <laughs> and the funny thing happens when you listen, you know, you get yeah, the great thing with transcribe is that it's got panning. It's got the center channel, like karaoke style, kind of where you can remove the center channel and then hear the things that are going on out here. Um, and then it's also got um, EQ. So by taking the bass all out or, you know, different things that you can do, you can get to where you can hear the parts easier. I find with Transcribe that if I turn on the karaoke thing sometimes and then I pan from side to side, I can hear a spot in the panning where one part I'm trying to get to might sound a little louder, a little clearer, you know, and then I'll stay there and I'll try and pick it out, but it ain't easy these days. So much stuff. It's, it's kind of amazing now that you can, um, well, here's the other thing I have, uh, is the heck is that app called? Um, there's an app called, da, 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 uh, that separates the guitar parts and everything. It's, Amazing computer. I don't know what the heck it's called, and I don't even know where it is anymore in my in my app thing. Uh, shit. So, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, let me ask Britt here, because she'll remember. What is that app called that separates all the tracks that you use? She'll, she'll remember. Um, okay, what else we got here? Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. I'll let you know in a second here what this app's called. There's a cool app. It, it's total AI, like computer stuff. That uh, Oh, yeah, Moises, M-O-I-S-E-S, -S -E Moises. Moises will uh, separate all the tracks. So it'll grab the guitar parts, the drums, everything, and separate it all. And it does it, you know, some crazy computer magic or whatever. So check it out. It's for, it's probably for, uh, it's for iOS as well as Android, I'm sure. Uh, that works really well. Um, but, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the, uh, the, the skill set or whatever, you know, just developing your ear and stuff. Uh, it's, I've been on for, t uh, I'm going to go another eight minutes here and then I'm going to split you guys. Um, I got I'm starting to, uh, we still got 466 people online, but I see a few of you are leaving. So that's enough guitar for now, but no, I'm going to hang for a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> there's a clip of Thomas McRocklin talking about playing live with Joe Satriani and he got really pissed with him because of his playing. Apparently wasn't that nice of a guy. Well, there's two sides to that story, so you never know. Right? We don't know what happened. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, 
Santana is quoted as saying, real musicians compliment and mean people hate in regards to respect. Yeah, yeah. Most most musicians I know are very complimentary and, um, you know, not haters. Let's see. Uh, there's a super chat I got to grab there. Just watching a Muppets clip. If you were part of the band, who would you be? I think Phil X would be animal. Well, there can only be one animal. Uh, who would you want to be? I can't remember the other guys in the Muppets band, to be honest. I'm just, I just remember Animal. It's been a minute since I've watched the, uh, the Muppets, but, uh, if I was, yeah, so maybe I, maybe, maybe uh, I'll play devil's advocate. If I was one of the Muppets, I'd be one of the old guys that heckles, <laughs> you know, the two old guys that sit there and comment on everything and just laugh. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you for the super chat though. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. People are selfish these days. Don't give a damn about others. You know, that's true, but, um, that's mostly just online. Like to, to people, you know what I find is to people's faces, the, the, the problem is, is often just internet and stuff, you know, it's like, cause there's no, there's this disconnect and then you just get to spout off and be a jerk or whatever. But you 99% of that stuff, people wouldn't say if they were face to face with somebody and there's a natural kind of empathy that happens a little bit more, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, it really got bad during the, the pandemic and when everybody was isolated and stuff, I, I think. And then everybody was like just in their own weird little online world and their very small little world with whoever they're hanging out with. Uh, but once we all got back out in the world, it was like an interact. It's like, oh, it feels good to be around, you know, to talk to people again and stuff. People weren't such jerks. So I don't know, you know. Have you ever jammed with or crossed paths with Richie Kotzen? He was on the show. I did a, actually during uh, COVID and stuff, he he was on, uh, I, I interviewed him. Uh, we had a little technical glitch at the beginning. I think I like edited it out or something, but the first you know, a few minutes, it wasn't working right. But anyways, you can watch it. It was a good interview. He, he ended up turning out great. And so he's on a, uh, on a Sunday live. Uh, I've been over to his house once for new year's. Um, he's a sweet guy, a sweet cat. Go, so going way back to the eighties, man, I, I wrote him a letter in 88 or 89 or something. When he put his first record out, he was like 17. And so was I, and I wrote him a letter. It said for correspondence, send to some address in Pennsylvania, you know, on the back of a, you know, his first shrapnel record LP, you know, I had a release from him and I sent him a letter and he wrote me back and wrote me a really nice note back. I, I was always impressed by that, that he took the time to, you know, to, to write me a letter back. And then I remember seeing him at the central, which is now the Viper room in LA, but before it was the Viper room, it was the central. And I went to see him play when I first moved to LA in probably 91 or 90 or 91 or something like that. And that, and I said hello to him afterwards and mentioned that he'd written me this, you know, letter and stuff like that. And I was the guy, you know, that <clears throat> I'm sure he did that to, for a lot of people, but anyways. Uh, and so over the years, I've run into him a number of times and, um, you know, I'm friendly with him now and stuff like that. And so I see him every now and then and stuff. He's a, he's a very nice guy. Him and his wife, Julia are n nice people, you know, uh, guitars for your project. If you have to use ears exclusively, would you still want to use an amp? It depends on the gig, uh, to be honest. Um, if it was a pop gig that was something akin to, say, the uh, Milan Farmer gig that I did, uh, you know, where I was on a riser, and this was a French tour I did with this, she was sort of considered like the French Madonna, you know, and it was a big arena tour where I was on a riser and the band's in the back, you know, and there's dancers and stuff like that. If it's that kind of tour, I don't think I would go to the trouble actually anymore of, of amps. I did use two loaded down heads on that tour in stereo. Um, and my sound sounded great in my in-ears, but to be honest, I'd probably at this point on a gig like that, quad cortex it or something, I think. Um, just because the guitar is such a blended in part of the music and uh, it was a lot of weight and, you know, heavy amps and stuff like that. And just kind of to bring, you know, and you can't hear them. There's no cabinet up there. So it's like, all right, you know, uh, it's come far enough where for those types of things, and I can't have a cab for feedback or anything like that. I just probably go direct uh, in in-ears. But um, any time that I can have a, excuse me, cabinet on stage, <coughs> you know, and if there's an option of a wedge, I sort of just prefer it. I just play better. I have more fun. 
and uh, you know have an have an amp up there I, on on tour with five for fighting when i play with those guys i'm going to go out and do a little bit with them in may as well as in august i use a quad into a power amp and two sir 112s and uh or if i'm flying i'll rent you know cab but it's basically like you know quad cortex into guitar speakers you know because i like to i get feedback and hear the amp on stage and then that allows me to not use in ears and just have a wedge and uh i just came to the conclusion that i just play better when i'm not on ears you know i'm more comfortable so uh yeah 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 uh are you friends with matt brock and wolfgang yeah um you know i know wolf a little bit i would say um and he's a he's a sweet cat and stuff but i am friendly with matt and we we worked closely together recently actually on the evh uh sde 3000 boss pedal release and i i was uh, you know over a period of months was talking to matt every couple of days and and going to work with him at 5150 and and they just to work closely with him on that pedal and stuff so um so matt uh i'm yeah, I, I consider Matt a, a, a friend for sure, you know. Wolf, I just, you know, I, I, I was friends with Ed, so but, but I would see Wolf up there sometimes at the and We had a couple good hangs and stuff with Ed and Wolf, both there and stuff. And uh, Wolf was, you know, this is going back over 10 years, but he was cracking me up back. He was a great was a sense of humor and really smart, really bright. Um, and then I saw him a couple times you know when i go see van halen shows and stuff i would see him backstage and stuff like that but i didn't i i didn't know him nearly as well as ed so um just see him every every now and then and stuff so uh, but he's he's a he's a good cat and uh uh you know nice nice dude and talented oh my goodness he can do anything uh i hear about dave's new ir pedal i think you're talking about the ird that leaked yeah that's uh his uh kind of uh twin sister dirty shirley sort of ird uh okay um what else we got here i know you got to take off soon uh but thank you for sharing your time hey it was so much fun i wouldn't miss it wouldn't miss it uh you're the nicest guitar expert i've ever seen or heard hey thanks man i don't know if i'm an expert i'm just a knucklehead but you know, I just geek out with you guys because you guys we're all into the same thing here, right? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Th thanks. Please come back again. And uh what happened to gear talk on this show? Well, we were just talking gear. I don't know. Uh, you gotta you gotta bring it up. It's up to you. You guys steer the chat. I get steered in directions. How does Mr. Sir feel about the pleck? I can't speak for him. I don't know if he's here anymore, but I think he has a uh <clears throat> I, I I don't want to speak for him, but I feel like John's thing, uh, because he's so stellar at frets and stuff, is he still feels like the human element of a fret job is the if you're good at what you do, you can do a more personalized thing. Pleck may be good like for uh well, it's all the you know, like how good are you at doing frets? If you're exceptional at it, I think he feels like a good luthier is the best, you know, way to go. Uh, maybe the plec is does a pretty darn good job if you're you know i i would say that that would be he would probably say something along those lines but uh yeah uh, uh if you're in guitar wars at a hotel mall bar would you do an electric solo or an acoustic <laughs> electric for sure absolutely no question in my mind i got two super chats there i gotta grab and then I'm, I should split. Uh, how long have you been a Sir artist? I first met Sir in 2006. Uh, I bought my first Sir in maybe 2004 or five, five, I think. Um, I bought it uh, out of the classifieds of the gear page. It was a, I, I think it was ocean turquoise, but it might've been another color blue. It's the one in the how to play eruption video. Uh, Sir classic S rosewood fingerboard um and i bought the guitar from somewhere in pennsylvania it came all the way across the country i opened up the case and i was like oh this looks beautiful i pulled it out of the case and i started playing and i sat there for 45 minutes and played that guitar and i realized this guitar is in tune but i didn't tune it when it came out of the case and it came all the way across the country 
in tune. And it's still in tune after I've been playing it for 45 minutes. I went, this is a very special guitar. And that was my first experience with the Sur. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, quickly, you know, not too long after that, Oh, there's John right there. I contacted the company and I went out and uh, met them out in Lake Elsinore. I remember meeting John for the first time and Ed Yoon and the folks that were there then. And he was in a different factory location. Then, and I had a uh, great experience meeting them for, for the first time. And the thing about John is that he had a obsession with quality that was immediately apparent. Um, it was his first and it was what his driving thing was the quality it had to there couldn't be problems with guitars or amps, you know, they had to just be, it drove them insane. Uh, you know, if there was a, any issues and, um, that I just really liked cause I liked precision things. I grew up liking nice cars and nice things that worked well. Uh, I, I had a real affinity for things that work well and are put together well and are, you know, it's just like, so I connected with him right away. And then we, you know, we ended up having good laughs and stuff like that and just became really good friends as well. So it was just a natural, very, very natural thing. And uh, and we're still great friends and work together and it's wonderful. So, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, John did answer the Plek question. Depends on who's doing the work in both situations. I wasn't too far off, right? We use a method that I have been using since the mid 80s and it's basically what Plek is doing. But for me, our method is... I don't know what he ended up saying after that, but uh, we, oh yeah, John also, I know he likes leveling frets under string tension so that the, the fret job reflects, you know, what, like, while the neck is got tension on it, as opposed to some people level frets with no tension, right? So they somehow simulate the tension and John's uh, feel strongly about that. I remember him talking about that quite a bit. He said it anyway, I'm just being repetitive, aren't I? There's Ben Coombs. Hey, man. Didn't see her uh, earlier. Sorry. Uh, just a heads up. I'm live tonight at 8 p.m. My my moderator and buddy Ben up there in Canada. What are your top three guitar -y things to do in Tokyo and top three non guitar -y things? What a great question. I'll be going back for more band-made concerts. Uh, top three guitar things. Um, just the shops, man. I mean, like the all the Shibuya shops like Ishibashi, Ikibe. Um, you know, and then close, uh, Daikonyama, uh, go up there and go to guitar traders for your vintage guitar fix. Love all that. That's all walkable. And it's a great, I uh, just get yourself some lunch and some coffee and walk between those two neighborhoods. And while you're up there at the, uh, guitar traders, you can go do some shopping around us in Daikonyama at some of the cool, it's like a cool neighborhood that just has a, you know, like kind of already neighborhood. It's cool. Go to uh, the Sutaya bookstore up there and have yourself a, a coffee while you're there. It's one of the most amazing bookstores I've ever seen in my life. It's not just books, but records and all kinds of stuff in Daikanyama. Uh, so Guitar Trader, Ishibashi, Ikibe, all that good stuff in, uh, you know, <clears throat> the Shibuya area. And then also make your way down to Shinjuku and go to Hyper Guitars and the store that I always forget the name of that's under Hyper Guitars that has a bunch of Japanese vintage guitars in it. Uh, sorry, not under, it's over. Hyper Guitars in the basement, right next door to the left. Great store for Japanese vintage stuff. It's fun, also fun to go to oh, Ochano Mizu, which is the where the uh, all the blocks of guitar stores are. So that's a that's a bunch of guitar stuff to do there. Um, the ESP store in Shibuya is also really cool. They sell a lot of parts. So if you want switch tips and pickup rings and stuff like that, and there's also just cool guitars in there, Japanese only kind of stuff that you'll only see there from Edwards and stuff. It's neat. And they have the ESP guitar museum upstairs. Oh, there's also the new Fender store or whatever you want to call it. That's kind of a must see if you're in Tokyo, because it's just crazy. It's in Haraj Harajuku and it's like eight floors of madness. There's a Fabergé egg guitar in there that's worth, I don't know, $10 million or something. <laughs> it's it's in Harajuku, and there's lots of other fun stuff to do around there. So check that out. Uh, Non-guitar things to do? Um, generally centers around food and fun places to go. Uh, uh, Beat Cafe, uh, where my friend Kato Man works, um, is my favorite dive bar in Tokyo. But also the little, I guess, uh, sort of, I don't know, Yokocho, I guess they're called. The, the uh, well, Golden Guy in Shinjuku, which is like all the little tiny bars, you know, and restaurants. Um, 
there's blocks of them. And I mean, they're tiny, like you can only fit four or five people in one of them at once. And some of them are themed, you know, there's an R and B one and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. The who one, this band, that band fun. Uh, there's, a, there's also another little district like that, like right by the train tracks in Shibuya, right by the train station. That's all the little bars and stuff. That's fun to go to, you know, it's just fun to hang out in those little places and make friends and talk to people from all over the world and locals and stuff. And people are very friendly there. It's great. Uh, yeah, just find some delicious ramen, sushi and all that good stuff too. Um, uh, I went to some neighborhoods the last time I was there that I had never been to, and they were really fun, actually. And I'm not going to remember the name of them right now, but there's so many great, you know, get out and get on the train and get a little bit out of Shinjuku and Shibuya and stuff and go. Well, one of them is Shimo Kitazawa. Love that. Lots of vintage clothing shopping there, if you like that sort of thing. And just food and little bars and things like that. It's fun. But Shimo Kita is a really cool neighborhood. It's just five stops on the train from Shibuya. It's like 10, 15 minutes. Okay, um, somebody's got a MIDI question. Buzz Crumberger, well, you're going to make me go elsewhere for MIDI. What was your MIDI question again? I kind of hate MIDI questions, but go ahead. <laughs> if I'll help if I can. Ask in the bottom of the chat. <laughs> Brit, the amazing girlfriend. <laughs> Brit's out on tour right now. She's out uh, playing with uh, Ari Abdul. And uh, kind of an amazing thing. Um, she's, th this tour is like y y these young girls that are like TikTok kind of uh, two girls and they're friends. One of them's 22 and one of them's 19. They're like really tight. And they're both like, you know, with 5 million listeners and one of them's 11 million listeners. And they're both friends and they came up together doing music and stuff. And on, on I'm talking on Spotify every month. And, you know, they got a ton of views on TikTok and all this stuff. But anyways, I went to a show the other night. I saw Brit play with them. These young, you know, they're young. The crowd's young. But, oh, my God, like the Troubadour was sold out, and I've never seen it so full. You know, it was packed, like packed the other night to the limit where the, I think the, you know, they could only get so many wristbands for crew and stuff like that because of fire marshal stuff. And um, and then she sent me a video from last night in San Francisco, packed, like people lined up down the street in this kind of small club, packed. Like, it's like, wow. And I've never heard of these girls, but these kids are in there singing every word to every song. It's just different now, man. The way that people get discovered and found out is pretty wild. So she's out for a month on tour with Ari Abdul. And uh, it's good. It's kind of like dark pop, you know, moody uh yeah yeah all right is there i think there might be a super chat or two that i gotta grab yeah there's one peter thank you my friend a bit late to the show great to have you here though videos this week so i'm working on one for the uh donner prince dictator pedal uh it's got lights on the eyes that are the guy that looks like saddam hussein that painted on the uh on the front <laughs> and the, the eyes light up when you play it's a little it's creepy actually right, right here See if you can see it. There it is. See the guy's eyes? Oh, my God. It's scary. Uh, all right. So that's coming. And then also I'm making a video for the... Oh, I'm, I'm going to do a quick one for the Sur SL68 to show off the new switches and stuff. So I've got a uh, my SL68 sitting right there, which has the mods. But I've got another one, just a stock one from them to make the video of. Not that mine's not stock, but mine's, you know, a bit more modded and stuff. That was the very first one ever made. John, do you remember? You made it. Uh... So video for that, video for uh, Game Changer, uh, Bigsby pedal. I've been meaning to do that for a long time. I've got an effect unit here, a, a modeler effect thingy from Hotone. I need to do that. I need to do like a whole bunch of stuff, and I just got to get done as much as I can before I go away for a few weeks on tour with Classic Rock Show. When being a hired gun, how often do you have to haul around your own rig, or is it always staffed and set up for you? Uh, as long as there's not... Issues, it's staffed and set up for me. Staffed. I mean, I have a tech when I'm on the road generally with gigs that I do. Uh, it's it, But it just depends on the gig. Five for Fighting, there's one guy that does the whole stage, basically. And he's great. Um, or at least the guy we had out last summer. Uh, sets up the drums, the piano, the acoustics, my guitar. But I'll go out and, you know, my stuff will all be out there when I get out there. And then I just kind of rough it in. And, you know, and I was tuning my own guitars on that gig. But I only play like two or three in the set. So it's takes me like three minutes, you know, it's easy. Uh, everything from that, but there is a guy that, you know, sets it up and breaks it down. And then I kind of 
to um, gigs where I have my own person taking care of me, you know, generally. So that said, um, my tech on the last tour, I had some tech issues on the last tour. I, I ended up having three different people throughout the tour because of different situations that arose. But uh, <clears throat> my main tech, Kyle, like at the, towards the end, he had to leave because he threw his back out. And uh, and there was one gig in Hargate. It was two gigs, actually, where I ended up just setting up all my stuff and doing... I basically was my own tech for two nights on the tour, which I can totally do, you know. Um, it's I, I know how to do it. So it's... This means you got to get there an, an hour early or whatever. It's, I can set up my own rig in probably 25 minutes, something like that. Two 412s, two heads, paddleboard, loom, six guitars, the whole nine yards, you know. Maybe half an hour it takes me. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks f for the super chat there. I think it's probably time to go. Oh, God, there's still more super chats. I don't want to miss you guys. Sorry. Guitars for your project. Recently saw Mr. Big here in, does that mean Oklahoma? Um, Paul was amazing. Curious to know how he keeps his guitar in tune. He says using 8.5 gauge. Interesting. Normally he uses eights, but down a half step for this tour. Wow, that is really light. I didn't know he played strings that light. Very interesting. Well, he must have just really controlled touch. I know he's got a strong left hand, like like uh, really, really, really strong. He's got big hands. If you look at him, Paul, he's got hands made for playing guitar. Um, but, you know, it all depends about your control and your attack and stuff like that. You can keep eights in tune. I'm on nines now, and I don't have any problem keeping them in tunes. So uh, can we have Sir as a guest so we can pick his brain? Absolutely, if he will do it. John, you've been here the whole time. Maybe you should uh, almost, maybe you should just uh, come on the show again in a week or two. Will you do it? That'd be fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, next week, um, I'm going to do this show from my home, uh, I think, because I've got to uh, take a little day trip later on that day uh, that involves a cat. So uh, I'm just going to uh, do it from my my place, and then I'll jet out and uh, and and do my errand that I need to run direct from my place. And then the following week will be I'll be out on the road, and I do believe that that following week. Let me see here. I'm just going to look at the calendar really quick. Uh, yeah, that following week. Don't. Quote me 100% on this, but the loose plan is that that is the week I will be out with Classic Rock Show. We'll have a gig somewhere in Illinois or something. We'll be, I'm not, I'm not sure where we'll be, but somewhere. And uh, we are going to, I think, announce the winner of the Sir Pete Thorne signature guitar from the Guitar Guitar Clinics. So anybody that's watching, if anybody was at any of my Guitar Guitar Clinics in the UK, two weeks from today will be the day that we actually... I think announce the winner and we're going to do it kind of as a fun, you know, like pre sound check. I'm going to start the live stream. We'll announce the winner, that kind of thing. And then I'll just take over and continue to do the show from, from the venue, that kind of thing. Cause I'll be out on the road then for a couple of weeks with those guys on the East coast. But so that'll be exciting. Somebody's going to win a guitar in a couple of weeks. I'll put up a watch page soon, probably this week for that one. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks again for making the time for this. Always appreciate it. Thank you guys. 100% can't do this without you. It's a cyclical thing. Uh, it's just fantastic. And I enjoy doing it every week. Still loving it. Hit that like button or you're a Britney Spears fan. Even if you are a Britney Spears fan, because I am. Toxic is my dirty pleasure song, my guilty pleasure song. Uh, Toxic is one of my favorite songs of all time. So. I'm a Britney Spears fan. Uh, everybody have a terrific week. Love y'all. Awesome. Take care out there. Thanks for all the super chats. Thanks, John, sir, for hanging out if you're still here. Over and out, everybody. Have a great week.